Yo, YouTube, the internet, planet Earth, podcast world, all y'all listening to me, watching me, and being here with me as I confess all the things I was wrong about, and that's what this series is about. Today, I'm back with episode number three, where we're going to be talking about how I was wrong about women. So this series is about the 40 things that I was wrong about in my 40 years of living on planet Earth. I turned 40 earlier this month. And so uh, it is of my great pleasure to share with you all the ways I was wrong, especially since I, uh, I make a lot of videos. I talk to a lot of people and I've been spewing a lot of stuff for many, many, many years. And, um, and I changed my mind. I grow, I learn. And I changed my mind, and I think that's okay. I think that's great for you to do also, too. The mind is not a static thing. So we got to allow ourselves the space to grow. And in my growth, I've learned, among many other things that we'll be exploring in this series, that I was wrong about women. So I've got a really amazing show lined up for you guys today. I also have a guest that's go a guest expert that's going to be joining me uh, in just a few minutes here, who's going to uh, you know, expand on this concept a little bit more, some of the things I was wrong about. In fact, I learned a lot by reading this man's books. Uh, he he kind of, he red-pilled me, as you would say. Uh, I swallowed that red pill, and it's, it's a bitter pill to swallow. Red pill comes from that term, comes from like, uh, if you think about The Matrix, the movie The Matrix, Morpheus was like, take the blue pill if you want to stay blind. Take the red pill if you want to wake the fuck up. And uh, taking that red pill, ain't, as, as Neo discovered, it's wonderful. It's great to be woke. But at the same time, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility and pain that comes with it. And, uh, and we're going to be talking about we're gonna be talking about that. So let me, uh, let me go to my outline here so that I can stay focused and to, and to provide everything that I think you guys need to know about intersexual dynamics, dark female nature, and that doesn't mean bad, it doesn't mean wrong, but dark meaning in the hidden, in the hidden realm, things that you don't see. You might not be able to see through those pretty gleaming smiles and eyes. Uh, at least I couldn't. I couldn't see these things until I took that red pill. And generally how I was wrong because that's what the show is really about. Hopefully, my experiences and my wisdom provide you with some insight. So let me go through this, uh, this bullet point. Um, so here's the outline for the show anyway, just so you kind of have an idea of how I go about these shows, uh, beginning with all the ways I was wrong. So I got seven, seven bullet points here that I laid out about things that I was wrong about when it came to women. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to talk about the intentions for this show and the intentions for having a guest on my show. And then I'll introduce my guest. And then I've got a lot of really, 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 really deep, dope, dark questions about female deception that I'm gonna be talking to uh, our guest about. And I'll introduce him in a moment. So uh, I remember growing up and there was this little riddle, little riddle that they used to say, they used to teach us as kids. And it goes like this. Sugar and spice and everything nice. That's what girls are made of, right? Little girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. And I've got three little girls. So I can, I can assert that there is some sugar and some spice there. But that's not everything they're made of. <laughs> we'll find out. Sugar and spice and everything nice. All the nice things. That's what women are made of. Nothing bad, nothing gross, nothing icky, hairy. Nasty, just sugar and spice and nice stuff. And then the poem goes on to say that uh, uh, frogs and snails and puppy dog tails, that's what little boys are made of. Now that sounds like some sort of mystic stew cooked up by a, by a witch. So you know that shit is backwards right away. Frogs and snails and puppy dog tails? That's what little boys are made of. Everything nice versus frogs. We're frogs. Just think about 
the manipulation that's associated with these little riddles, right? And that's just the tip of the iceberg, because if you watch Disney movies, you know what I'm talking about. Kiss that frog. Turn him into a prince. Our whole culture has been Disney-fied. I think Disney has been the, the greatest propaganda machine to, uh, to turn the sexes against one another, to, to give the female this fairy tale, this fantasy about love. And as we're gonna talk about in a moment, women manipulate men and men are easily manipulated. And we'll talk about why we're so easily manipulated. So you get a bunch of little girls walking around in princess gowns, thinking that everything's, uh, everything's uh, on Disney is true, that they're princesses, that they gotta kiss a frog to make a prince. Just think about that concept. Men, boys, puppy dog tails, snails, and frogs. Kiss a frog. That means the man is an ugly, wet, slimy beast. Not even fit to be a beast, a frog. A reptile, right? Not, not even mammal, fucking frog. And the kiss, the sweet sugar and spice kiss, caress, and love of a woman will turn him into a prince. And, and that just, I mean, if you think a little deeper, that just, it just sounds retarded because how's he gonna learn how to be a prince when he was a frog? Is the woman gonna teach him how to be a prince? Is that how it's gonna happen? You're going to kiss this ugly frog and he's going to become exactly the kind of man you want. I can tell you right now, women don't know what kind of man they want. Men got to show them. <laughs> They're instinctual. It goes by instinct, not logic. But I, what is that word when you, when you get off track? I, uh, I digress. I digress. I digress quite a bit. So we're going to get back on track here and uh, I'm going to assert that it's not true. Women are not. Girls are not sugar and spice and everything nice. They poop, they bleed, they fuck, they stink. They do all the things men do. There are puppy dog tails there as well. So a little bit about my experience uh, growing up with mostly boys. I grew up, you know, the oldest of uh, three boys. And my, my sister was the youngest. And uh, it was tough for her because she grew up around all boys. And she was the youngest girl. And, um, and so she's a tough girl. So she was like one of, she was like one of the guys. I think it was challenging for her. But, uh, you know, in the neighborhood, I was the oldest boy, strongest boy. When it was time to pick teams for phys ed, I was always the captain, captain of the football team. So I like to think of myself, especially when I was growing up, as king of the boys. And as a re result, didn't have much experience with women except for mommy, my auntie, and school teachers. And so the authority, the major authority for most men, most American men, most Western men, are not fathers, they're not men, they're mommy and school teachers because we spend the majority of our time either at home with mommy, right? And for me, it was my auntie also uh, because daddy's at work or daddy's not in the home or daddy's in jail or daddy, 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 daddy's not there. People say we live in a patriarchy, but I think it's a matriarchy. I, I'm very convinced we live in a matriarchy. Um, so we've got influence from mommy and then you go to school and something like 90% of school teachers are women. So this creates this, at least a sense in myself growing up, and I recognized it in me, of being addicted to the approval of women at an early age. Because, uh, you know, if they're your authorities, they're going to tell you how to be, and if you're not being that way, then you're a bad boy. And when you got women telling you how to be a good boy, they're, they're using the female measuring stick. They're using what makes a good girl the measuring stick for a boy. In traditions past, I tend to be nostalgic about that. Who knows what the hell happened in the past? But the way it's presented, in traditions in the past, men were, young little boys were groomed, trained, and taught how to be men by men. Go figure. But we've got the, we've got the matriarchy and we got the media. Telling, it, telling men how to be men and that's why we're so fucking confused in so many different ways. And a big part of the a big part of the, the confusion comes from this needing approval. Approval from women, it starts with older women, and then, uh, and then it begins to creep into the realm of dating and dealing with young women. 
And so just to kind of go along my story a little bit and uh, how I got lost in this regard, um, I remember, and, and, and even well into my adulthood, seeking the validation and approval of women for no reason too. It wasn't even like, you know, seeking it for sex. It was like, oh, this is a woman. I ought to be a good boy or, um, you know, whatever, whatever uh, uh, man up phrases they use. To, to that which really mean be a good little girl with a penis and so looking for validation from a wim from women it's a bad place to be we'll talk about it why school mother media and then i i have to i have to share that i became sexual at a very young age around the age of 13 and uh and i became addicted to the attention of little girls here i am King of the hill, boys. You know, I dominated on the football field. Leader of the boys. But the minute a girl came around, I melted. And I got giddy. And I got weird. I remember myself. I remember myself in like 7th and 8th grade. Uh, being head over heels. And, and like girl after girl after girl. 31 flavors. It was like uh, I had a new crush every week. And I became very ungrounded. I was a kid. You know, I didn't know any better. But... Not only needing the approval, but also now needing the feels. Ooh, ooh, the emotion associated with it, right? Getting boners too as a kid. And so um, at a very early age, that, that, that neediness, it goes from, it goes from this, uh, this needing of approval because you, know, you want to be a good boy to this needing of approval for, oh, maybe she'll kiss me. Oh, maybe she'll touch me. Oh, daydreams, night dreams, fantasies about girls being sugar and spice and all that nice stuff. And so um, for a lot of young men, and, and, and I'm admitting for myself included, especially very early on when you start becoming sexual, uh, all of your masculine grounding begins to crumble. And then it goes from needing approval to needing sex, needing the neediness, wanting, sensuality, sensuality. Addiction to sensuality is a big, part, a big issue in our culture. And men, we get trapped because it starts with, it starts with sex. All right? and, uh, and if you don't have that self-possession, which I think is super critical for young men to learn, that's why I believe that promiscuity in young men is not a good idea. We'll talk to Rolo. Oh, my guest. I just let the cat out of the bag. It's this book right here. Those of you who know, you'll see. Um, you know, uh, he may have some different ideas about that. Of course, other people have different ideas about that. But I don't think promiscuity in young men is a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea to be out there jizzing and juking and putting your junk inside all these women. Because uh, among other things is easy manipulation. Because what we think is love is lust. And, uh, and it's very sensual. It's very physical emotion, emotion and sensuality. And uh, just like addiction to crack, you, there's a physical dependence. And so you, there are all kinds of uh, demons begin to arise, jealousy and fear, these kinds of things. So uh, becoming very sexual at an early age, um, I'm not going to go too much into my story with my wife, but I am very grateful that... Uh, that I met the woman that I would spend the rest of my life with uh, at that early age. I became addicted to her. <laughs> but then my promiscuity and tendency for promiscuity began to decline. I, I no longer was uh, seeking validation or sex from a lot of women because well, my needs were met. And um, you know, that's neither here nor there. I'm not advocating for that, but I think there's a lot of benefit in my being with one woman for all these years. Save me a whole lot of uh, confusion and pain that I see young men going through. So uh, moving on, uh, just a few more things that I was wrong about before I bring Rolo on. We've got a few minutes here before I, I bring him on. Uh, women understand. I was wrong about this, understanding women's love. I thought women loved the way that men love. And you got to understand, men, we love in an idealistic way, uh, we, it, meaning that we, we put women on a pedestal where women live in a materialistic way. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that with Rolo. I learned that from, from him and from watching a couple of other videos. But women's main uh, priority, which is normal and natural, it's based, it, 
a lot of the things we'll be talking about is not because women are, are bad. It's because we've been tricked. We've been fooled about it. Uh, rather than being able to look at nature, look at women, look at the sexual dynamics for what they are. But women are interested in safety and security and getting along. Men are more interested in liberation. And so we idealize things. And women, they, they're in this way, are far more practical. Uh, some other pieces of bullshit that I digested uh, in my years is that women, women, women can do anything that men can do. Good as any man. Not true. It doesn't take much to, I don't really have to expound on that. It doesn't take much to, to see that the sexes are different. We have individual superpowers, right? Women have, women have an innate superpower that allows them to make more people, right? It's, it's the greatest gift on earth. And men have the innate superpower of power of strength. And so on, in the physical realm, men are dominant. That's the way it is. We, we, it's, we, it's a natural order of things. Men are, men are dominant, not dominators, not dominatrix, but the dominant. And it doesn't mean better, but it means that we're the providers, we're the protectors, and we are the penetrators of the matter, the women. So, um, yep, we've been tricked, we've been fooled. Along with this whole uh, transgenderism, you know, you can be whatever, you can be 25 different sexes and that men are, are like women and women are like men. You know, we're living in the backwards culture. Uh, number six is um, I don't believe sexual promiscuity is good in men. I don't believe it's ideal. Let me text Rolo real quick and let him know that I'm, I'm just running a couple minutes late. I'm a, I'm a bad host. Yep, so let me just continue. Hey, bud, comma, give me about five minutes. I'm wrapping up my intro, comma, then I'll bring you in, period. Okay. Okay, very quickly. Now, sexual promiscuity, not a good idea for men or women. Uh, and then number seven, men are the natural and God appointed leader in the home. And, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about my parents and how that showed up and why I'm grateful for my parents being the way they are. I also, as I've evolved and grown up, I see, I see my mommy a little differently, <laughs> which I think is good for all men see their mommy a little differently. I saw, I, I can see a little bit of how she resented my dad because of my dad's power. And I think all women, if they're unconscious, do this they resent men they resent men for their power because they don't embrace their own power because they've been tricked by the world to think that they need to compete with men rather than being great women so um but you know so that was my experience my dad was a great leader in the home and uh and that's the, that's the god appointed natural order of things it's in the bible folks those of you guys who believe the bible the bible the bible reflects a lot of what's natural in the world. Okay, moving on real quick. The intentions for the show, number one, uh, to discuss the dark side, the hidden side of female nature and intersexual dynamics. Number two, identify, and this is a big part of it, this is a big part of it, because Rolo can talk. Uh, identify and clarify red pill language and terminology. Those of you guys who are getting red pilled, introduced to the red pill, to the manosphere, to intersexual dynamics, to the rational male, all these things that I'm talking about that I've been interested in for the past year and that you guys are here for, um, you, gotta, you gotta understand the language. That was one of the first things that, uh, that dawned on me was, whoa, there's a whole bunch of terms here that I've never heard before. So we're gonna, we're gonna kinda, we're gonna explore that with Rolo. And like I said, my, my guest today is Rolo Tomasi. And I first learned about Rolo when I began the concept, uh, began learning about the concept of MGTOW, men going their own way. And uh, that came because you guys, my viewers, were asking me questions about various different things, one of which was, Elliot, what do you think about MGTOW? Well, I had to do some deep research. And at first glance, I really liked it. I still like it. I still like the concept. Not everything that, uh, that is good in concept is good in practice, meaning, you know, it's how it's being executed. So there are a lot of hang-ups people have with Bing Tao, but um, I generally think that it's the right movement. It's a good movement. And uh, an old friend, so I, I made a video about Bing Tao. You can, you can find it on this channel. An old friend reached out and told me that I must read The Rational Mail. And he actually gave me a copy. 
And this was during my trip last year after Grounding Man in June uh, in New York. And I spent the rest of my vacation devouring Rolo Tomasi's books. Um, and, uh, and this year I'm going to be going back. To, I'm doing Grounding Camp in New York in June again. If you're watching this beforehand, you can get tickets down below. It's, uh, it's, about, it's about the stuff we'll be talking about here. Being a man, intersexual dynamics, putting women in their place. I don't think we need to put women in their place if we stand in our place. When, when men stand in their place, women can relax into their place. And uh, anyway, he's best known for his books and his contribution to the Manosphere. I think you guys are going to enjoy the show. We'll be back in a sec with Rolo Tomasi. All right, and we're recording. We're here. We're back with a new show with my guest, Rolo Tomasi. Uh, real quick, actually, before we go any further, Rolo, you go by Rolo or Rollo? Just Rolo. That's fine. Rolo. Rolo. Mm -hmm. Man, I got to be honest. I like Rollo sounds like Apollo. Doesn't it? And that just sounds, <laughs> that sounds super alpha. <laughs> you know, it's like the, guys, the guys on the Red Man group joke around with me, and they say, oh, you're Royo today. You know, they try to do the Spanish the Spanish telling of it, and it's, it's actually, again, it's, it's my pseudonym, it's my writer, it's my pen name, right? So um, people always ask me, you know, where'd you come up with that? And there's actually kind of two, thing, two reasons I, I <laughs> stuck with it. The first one is that, obviously, it's, uh, if you have watched um, L.A. Confidential, the movie L.A. Confidential um, from 1997, you will figure out why I named myself Rolo Tomasi. So that's a, that's a little hint right there. And the other thing is, is like, I think it's one of, was one of the, the great Viking kings or great Viking leaders. His name was Rolo. So I'm like, done. I'll, I'll stay with that. <laughs> well, I'm always learning something new from you, dude. I thought that yeah. was your real name. No, 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 no. That's my, that's my, my, my writer's name, my pen name. Well, it seems but everybody like knows me. Yeah. You know, everybody knows me as that. And people always say, well, you know, you should just go by your regular name. I'm like, no, nah, cause like, you know, Stephen King, that's not his real name. You know, Daniel Steele, that's not her real name. Um, a lot of writers use a pen name uh, just to, well, you know, separate one life from another. And I didn't really see the, I didn't really see the utility in that until I had, you know, three best-selling books. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just keep the name. So. Yeah. And it seems like that's a typical practice in the manosphere. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this is all brand, you know, the, the whole idea of the manosphere is kind of new to me. And I'm so grateful to be speaking with someone who, is often considered the godfather. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? The godfather. That, that's, of that's, what they, that's what they call me. Um, I am one of the three R's of the Manosphere. It's Rolo, Roosh, and Roycey. And um, how I got that title was, I'm just one of the old guard. I'm one of the guys who was there from the beginning. Um, as far as my history is concerned, I used to be a moderator at this forum called So Suave. And So Suave was a pickup a pickup artist forum, but it became so much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of um, a lot of forums that were seduction forums. Like there was uh, alt fast seduction, and there was mystery method, and there was RSD, and there was a lot of other forums that were out there. So Suave was one of those forums. Mm -hmm. And uh, the great thing about So Suave is that it sort of developed and it it matured. Uh, and, you know, it didn't it never like gave up on on seduction, but it, it matured a little bit more. So there was um, there was more to it. Um, so it was a collection of guys coming together and sharing their experiences and really kind of coming up with ways to live a better life. Right. Eventually it was that at first it was, how do I get my wife to sleep with me again? Or yeah. to, to have sex with me again? How do I get a girl? If, and we had a, we had a, uh, we still do actually have a, um, a high school forum. So there was high school guys and there was uh, the mature man's forum. There was the general forum. There was, you know, all these things that were, uh, you know, all these different interests. And I always thought that was really great because um, I like to have discussions. I like to have debates with people. I like to, to come up with an idea and then have it um, tested, have it tested through experiment, have it tested through the crucible of debate. Um, and that's really what uh, So Suave ended up being. And uh, it wasn't until 2011 that I launched the Rational Mail as a, as a blog because everybody kept saying, you really need a blog, you need a blog. Mm -hmm. And it was around that time, 2010, 2009, somewhere around there that, um, 
that Roycey and Roosh were really starting to come up. And so people started saying, you're, you're, you're one of the third R's. You're, you're the third R of the Manosphere. And I didn't even know what the Manosphere was. We weren't even really calling it Red Pill or any of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, were, we were calling it Red Pill back as far as 2002, but it was only because we were um, making references to the Matrix. Like, you know, you need to cut yourself away from, from the conditioning that you've had since you were a kid and you need to sort of open your eyes. That's why, that's one of my yeah. little catchphrases in all my books. It's, uh, I use that line from the, from the matrix where, um, or Morpheus tells Neo, you know, or Neo says, you know, they're rebuilding Neo, right? And, and Neo says, why do my eyes hurt? And Morpheus says, you've never used them before. And that just kind of uh. stuck with me for a very long time because that's really what, I've been doing since 2001, 2002, when I first started writing and, and having these discussions and connecting these dots. Um, and it's really just an eye-opening experience for guys, but it hurts. It hurts to open yeah. their eyes. It hurts to see this new truth. It hurts to, to, you know, we always talk about the anger phase when it comes to um, unplugging yourself from your old life, or you go through like the five stages of, of grief really is what the five stages of unplugging are. Um, because you're mourning your old life, you're mourning the the mm -hmm. death of that beta blue pill version of yourself. But the anger and the frustration and all that, all the the part that hurts from opening your eyes, uh, there's more opportunity and there's a, yes. a re, you can you can build real goals because you now have access to the truth. So so all of the ideals and the hopes that you had prior to to your unplugging. Right. Um, it, it, like I always say, the truth will set you free, but it doesn't mean that the truth won't hurt. And that's, that's where that comes from anyway. So, okay. Yeah. So a lot of people, a lot of people are not blue. A lot of people are blue pilled. A lot of people are not red pilled. Mm -hmm. even, the, even the type of conversation we're having right now, people might be wondering what the hell is this guy talking about? Mm -hmm. And I think a great place to begin is with a term that uh, I learned from reading your books where you refer to the feminine primary social order. Mm -hmm. and, and when you are privy to this, you start to see it everywhere. They'd like mm -hmm. to say that we live in a patriarchy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case. I think we live in a matriarchy. And I think it, this term feminine primary social order has everything to do with it. Right. Can you tell us more about what that is? Okay. When I first started writing, um, I, I used to refer to this, I still do refer to this as the feminine imperative. Now people always say, well, that's the, that's just feminism. No, that's not feminism. Well, for the feminine imperative is whatever best suits a woman's imperatives, whatever best suits her purposes, whatever best suits her life goals, her sexual strategies, um, whatever it is that promotes uh, women's well-being is the feminine imperative. So is, is feminism part of the feminine imperative? Yes, it is. It is, a, it is, a, a, it is the social and political, and I would even say religious now, arm mm -hmm. of the feminine imperative. So when I talk about us being living in a, a feminine primary social order, a lot of people will, that's the long way of saying a gynocracy or mm. um, what I call a gynocracy, um, what other people call gynocentrism, which means that we are focused on the well-being or focused on the, the purposes and the imperatives of women um, as a, and this is primarily in Western society, but it's also expanding into other, other societies as well. So I have two posts and there are actually two posts, but there's two chapters in the first book and um, they are the feminine reality and um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, the, the feminine reality was probably the best one to look at. There's another one about the feminine imperative as well. Um, all it is, is, is you realizing that the way that our social order has been structured ever since the sexual revolution, but also, pri also prior to that, has been men measuring up and qualifying and, and, and creating a world in which women's well-being is taken care of. It is always a, a, a primary goal. Like when I talk, when we talk about chivalry, for example, when I talk about chivalry, chivalry actually used to be just between men. It used to be just, um, uh, it, it used to be a, a, a social order amongst men. So that says, you know, you don't hit a man when, you, when he's down. And it used to be uh, based on uh, masculine honor. Um, it used to be something that um, the old church in, in, in uh, Western Europe would use to sort of control men who had 
armor and swords and could, you know, they were basically brigands, you know, they, it was sort of this code of honor in Japan. It was also like the Bushido code, right? Mm -hmm. It was, you, you have an honor for your opponent, you respect your opponent. Um, and there was a, there was a, a pretense of honor. Well, what happened is uh, the chivalry that we know, like when, when, when women are saying, oh, chivalry's dead, you know, nobody holds the door open for me anymore and nobody you knows how to treat a lady, that kind of stuff. That is when chivalry switched to, um, to, me, to, to mean, the meaning was switched to say that you need to respect a woman's honor and you need to add all of these extra things about women into chivalry. And I always say that chivalry was actually feminism 1.0. It was how can we insert the feminine imperative into a masculine imperative and then make that masculine imperative about the feminine. And that's why when we think about chivalry in a romantic sense, um, you know, like, like uh, I forget who the comedian is, but we say, you know, chivalry is dead and women are the ones that killed it, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why we think of, we, we associate chivalry with women right now is because way back then women said, you know what, that's, this is a, we can use this. We, women's power back then has always been covert. Now it's become overt. Mm -hmm. So feminism is an overt form of power over men, whereas like chivalry was a covert form of power over men. So yeah. there was still the feminine imperative still existed way back in medieval times and even before that where there, you, know, you had to respect a woman. And you know, women would like, to, would like you to think that they were always treated as, as chattel, that they were always you know, treated as property. And maybe that was true in some senses, but a good woman was always respected. A good woman was, all, you know, you can find this in the Bible as well. You know, what, what's, a, what's a good woman? Well, there's, there's plenty of descriptions in the Old Testament about, you know, what a, you know, what a respectable good woman was. There was a respectable woman, and then there was a woman that were, un, that were not respectable. So you had these qualifications of what that woman, that woman was, but the reason we as men think of that is because the feminine imperative inserted its, its purpose into man's purpose, into male's purpose. Mm -hmm. That's why I always, when I talk, I, I like to use chivalry as, a, as an example of that because chivalry was a male space that the feminine imperative worked its way into covertly under the, under the radar and then repurposed that male space to be about women. That's why we still think about it. Well, now after the sexual revolution, we don't need that anymore. Women, uh, women can, you know, earn their own damn money, right? Women don't need no man. Women need a man like uh, a fish needs a bicycle, right? There's the, the old Gloria Steinem crap. Okay. Today we have so unfettered women's sexual strategies and so empowered women that they no longer need to be subtle. They no longer need to be nuanced. That's why you see women in marching at the women's march with the, what we call the pink KKK, right? The pink, the pink pussy yeah. hats and all that stuff. Um, they even have a uniform now. So when I talk about the gynocracy, when I talk about uh, feminine primary social order, it is everything that you're seeing around you. And it's, um, it's also evidence of what I call the red pill lens. And I think you're probably getting the red pill lens right now because if you've been reading my stuff and if, you, if you're looking around you and you, you can't help but listen to a, a song that you used to like, you mm -hmm. can't help but watch a movie or a, a, you know, a TV series that you used to like, or you're reading something or you're hearing something in the news and you, you now have your red pill lens on <laughs> and you can't unsee it. It's like that. Um, yeah. Did you ever see that movie, uh, They Live with Rowdy Roddy Piper where he puts on the the glasses and he looks and it's like and the whole world is different with the with the special glasses on yep. that's what uh that's what the red pill lens is like it's like yeah, you seeing, can't not see you're it seeing yeah you can't unsee it now yep. <laughs> and that's why i always tell guys when they when they like they'll they'll read my book or they'll 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 un with what we call unplug or they'll um they'll put away their blue pill conditioning and they'll they'll become red what i call red pill aware they want to tell their friends. They want to say, hey, man, uh, put on these special glasses, right? And you will see this as well. well a lot of guys aren't ready for that. And they, they cannot handle mm -hmm. um, un, you know, seeing that world in that way because you can't unsee it. Right. Even when people go into denial about the, the feminine primary social order, when they say, no, 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 I, I, I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be a part of this. Um, remember that part in, I don't know if you've seen the matrix, but in the part in the matrix where Neo, uh, they, what Morpheus reveals the real world to Neo and Neo can't handle it. And he, he breaks down on the floor and he pukes on the, on the 
on the deck and and uh he wants to go back and he wants to go back but you can't unsee it you can't right. go back because even if you could go back um even if you could unsee it or or put yourself back into that old frame of mind you're still going to see things on the periphery you're still going to see well that's what rollo said about that or mm -hmm. that's what that's what elliot said about that or that's what these guys were talking about over here and you can't you you can live with blinders on but you can't unsee what is the what they call the world pulled over your eyes and i think that that's really hard for a lot of guys to accept because their existence is based on the hope of all of those old blue pill conditioned ideals and dreams and hopes and all the things that disney sold them when they were little boys right. and little girls right um and so they really want to cling to that they really want to be um they really want to go back to it's like you know and again and uh, using the matrix again cypher wanted to be you know plugged back in he didn't want to remember <laughs> right. anything he wanted to go back to it which is kind of ludicrous because you're asking the people who are you know you, the, the people who enslaved you to re-enslave you but just to you know make you special and a special slave mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> i always thought that was kind of an interesting analogy you mentioned movies and music. It's so funny because now I listen to songs that like I that I enjoyed maybe when I was in college when I was mm -hmm. ill, and I can't stand them. In mm -hmm. fact, it's funny. This weekend, uh, Colleen and I went and we watched a play. Every year since we moved to Florida, they do uh, American Stage in the Park. So they, you know they they mm -hmm. open up the park and they put on a stage. This year it was Mamma Mia. And I don't watch movies. <laughs> so you must know. You must know. Uh, I, I, have, I have been subjected to Oh, movies. man. So <laughs> five minutes into the, into the show, I checked out because I was like, female primary social order. This mm -hmm. is it. This is it at its finest. So long story short, the, the movie's about or the show's about a, uh, a woman who was a slut when she was younger. Now she's mm -hmm. old and empowered, but has regrets. She has a mm -hmm. daughter. And, and, the, and, the, and the daughter wants to know who her father is. So the mm -hmm. whole thing is about like, the girl's getting married, she wants her father to, to give her away, um, but mom was, was screwing around, so she, she didn't know who the seed is, where mm -hmm. it came from. Mm -hmm. But what really, and so of course, in the beginning, I'm like, all right, I'm rolling my eyes. But the moral of the story, it turns out, which it was like, this is the icing on the cake, and it's all over the place, and guys are clapping and shit, mm -hmm. is uh, you don't need to know who your daddy is. There's no need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't need to know your father. It's okay mm -hmm. that your mom was a slut. You don't know who your dad is. And, uh, and you just need yourself. Oh, so this boy. is a big, big uh, slap in the face for someone who's got the, the lenses on. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, where else do you see in our world things that people take for granted mm -hmm. that are clearly a part of uh, how did you say gynocentrism? I, gyno, yeah, gynocentrism, gyno, uh, the gynocracy, uh, feminine primary social, or the fem yeah, whatever. Um, yes. There's a there's a lot of it. There's a lot of evidence around you. Like I I think that the easiest one to see is in the movies right now. Um, yeah. When you see like the all female cast of Ghostbusters or the all female, it's 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 gotten to the point where they don't hide it anymore. They don't have to hide it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that mainstream pop culture has embraced this ideal of of the, fe the, f the future is female, right? They were hoping against hope that Hillary Clinton was going to be the president, and they planned ahead for that like years in advance. They, uh, the, the mainstream media, uh, pop culture planned ahead for the first female president. Right. And so as what I thought was interesting is they, they, they scrambled to cover up that. Like uh, a really good example of this is, I don't know if you watch House of Cards, but when... Um, when the the final season of 2016's House of Cards ended, it was a setup to set up Claire Underwood, the the the, the wife or the female interest in the in the movie, to be the president, to to become somehow become you know through whatever shenanigans, to become like you you had this idea that we were going to see her in in the presidency and what they were trying to do what the writers were trying to do was reflect what they believed was going to happen in the next year which was right. we're going to have a female president mm -hmm. and if you look at the the 2017 super bowl commercials of that time mm -hmm. they expected they fully expected there to be a female president so all of the commercials that they had shot because they can't afford to shoot a million dollar commercial um you know within you know a couple of months before the super bowl so they're they're planning they're planning way out 
Um, and I see a lot of ad agencies do this. Like, cause I'm a, I'm a, I come from a branding, art direction, um, advertising, marketing background. So I know how those agencies work. I know how they operate. And most of them are, are filled with uh, graduates from uh, an, you know, an academic institution that has taught them to be as, as militantly feminist as they possibly can. Wow. And that's the nicest way that I can put that as militantly feminist as they can as they can or to promote the feminine as much as they can that's why i'm saying right now i've been i've been saying that um we're we're presently in a gender cold war mm -hmm. um because we're seeing ever since and i yes i made this prediction back in october when i did the state of the manosphere address at the 21 convention mm -hmm. but i also made a couple predictions on december 29th of 2018 for one of the red man groups that we were doing and a lot of these have already come to pass in fact i was actually shocked at how quickly they came to pass yeah. because as soon as january hit then we see the Gillette commercial that comes out that, that everybody was, and, and now we see in, in April that Gillette sales are down as a result of that. Yep. Um, at least that's the, that's the prognostication is that they, they were, what happened anyways. So you have the Gillette commercial, then you have the APA ruling, which is the American Psychological Association, who came out with a guideline for if you are a certified APA psychologist, you must follow these guidelines if you want to maintain your, uh, your certification. And those guidelines are this, is that traditional masculinity is a psychological disorder. Right. And that's what they want you to accept. And that's what they want you to teach. And they want you to incorporate into your practice that men who are conventionally masculine men have something wrong with them, that there is um, I'm literally some, uh, it, there, I would, I would say, I would not be surprised if they put it in the diagnostic and statistical manual in the next edition of this is that, you know, traditional masculinity is in some way, but what you're seeing is you're seeing an ide ideological belief get into um, not just psychology, but it's now filtering into the hard sciences as well. So we're seeing um, any kind of uncomfortable truths that are revealed in hard sciences, even in STEM fields right now, anything that doesn't reflect the feminine imperative, anything that doesn't reflect well on women, they, it, it goes down a memory hole or else they, uh, in, in, this is in academia, of course, or they, um, you risk losing your tenure, you risk losing everything that you have, you risk losing your, your well-being, you risk losing maybe even your family, maybe even your, your marriage, whatever, if you don't toe that line, if you don't agree with what the feminine imperative is, is expecting of you as being somebody who is a, in a position of authority, particularly if you're at a college. If you say, hey, men and women are different, and here the, here's the differences. Here's why you, you either have to temper that or you're going to be, uh, you're going to be ousted from that, from that, you know, whatever your job was or your tenure, you're going to lose your tenure because of that. They don't want to hear that. It's this ideological purity and that is based on how well you tow the feminist line or how well you promote the feminine. And it's, it's much more dangerous for, for men than it is for women. You will definitely lose your job if you dare dare to say something that, you know, men and women are biologically different and that the blank slate is, is just BS. So you were going to lose something like that. Then you, then we move on and you can see, I mean, in pop culture, it's pretty easy. You, I was just uh, talking with Pat Campbell um, on his show on Friday, last Friday, and his producer introduced me to a song called um, Joan of Arc and it's by Little Mix. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I, I, you don't need to go listen to the music, but go look at <laughs> the lyrics for that at some point. It's called, it's, uh, it's called Joan of Arc, and it's Little Mix, and everything in that is exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to pop culture uh, reinforcing over and over and over again the feminine imperative. Right. And it's just like, it's basically the same thing as Mamma Mia, right? It's, it's, uh, yeah. it's saying you don't need no man. Men are superfluous. They're nice to have around, but they're not necessary. Right. You can do it all, girl. You can, you can, it's the same feminist lie we've been teaching and, and selling to our girls ever since the sexual revolution that you can live like a man free of consequences. Right. There are no checks and balances on your sexual strategy. There are no checks and balances on anything that you want to do because we want to empower women so much so that there is no consequences, that there is no, uh, you know, results or, or liabilities for what the, the choices that they make, because there will always be a man there either to blame or there will be a man who will go and fix it for you. And so like, what's, what's interesting about Mamma Mia is that's a very 
a, a very common story because one one common theme I see now in uh, in pop culture and in in mainstream society, normie society, right, is this what I what I call war on paternity. And what that means is it doesn't matter who the father is. It doesn't matter, like just like you, like you were saying before in, in Mamma Mia, it's, it doesn't matter who your dad was. It just matters whoever the guy was that raised you. It doesn't matter what, it is, like biological paternity makes no difference. And we are taught this, and, and this is from a man's point of view. A man should not have any entitlement to, to being certain that that child is his child. We have laws right now that prohibit doctors from telling the, the father that he's not actually the biological father. And that if, mm. if they, like right now, uh, uh, it's, <laughs> I'm sure you probably heard of like 23andMe or these DNA tests where you yeah. go and you find out like what's your, what's your racial and what's your ethnic and what's your nationalistic history is. Well, yeah. a lot of men are finding out that the kids that they thought were theirs are not actually theirs because of that just fun test that we're going to do, right? So they find out that they're not actually the fathers. And what do we do with that? We're finding out that cuckoldry, like real live cuckoldry is, is more, <laughs> more common than, than we would like, than, than the society would like us to believe. And the other thing is that we want to, we've, we've changed the, we've changed the rules for men to claim ownership or to claim parenthood whatsoever as it is from from women women can do it all women women are told that they can uh, be just as effective father as they can be a mother mm -hmm. uh, forty three percent of children are born out of wedlock right now mm -hmm. um, so when when a guy tells me he's uh, you know he's an adoptive father that's one thing but when you are cuckolded because you married a single mother who expected you to to accept the parental investments of a guy that she bred with prior to you coming there well that choice was made for you before you even arrived on the scene mm -hmm. so in my book that's cuckoldry mm -hmm. anytime a man accepts the parental investment responsibilities of another man that is cuckoldry. So it can be either proactive or it can be retroactive. But the society tells men, you're a hero if you do that. You are, right. you are to be like, you're, um, you know, we're, you're to be celebrated if you, if you put down your natural, innate, evolved um, desire or, or need to ascertain whether or not the child is yours, whether or not that kid is yours. Because when, when we're talking about um, I'm talking about reproduction. When a man puts off his sexual strategy, which is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality, the only thing that he, the only prerequisite that he has of a woman is that he knows that the kid he has is his actual kid, that his genetic legacy is going to go on. Because if it wasn't like that, you would see, you know, it, it would, if, if it wasn't a guy who, if, if, if that wasn't that important, then you would see um, generation after generation of men who it was in their it wasn't in their biological interests to not be like that, to not almost be obsessively concerned with paternity. And so what, what society and what the, the feminine primary social order is teaching men right now is that it doesn't matter who the kid is. Right. It doesn't matter. It's, and what that is, is it's just handing over more and more reproductive control over to women. So it's giving women 100 um, percent authority over the reproductive process, where it's placing 100 percent responsibility of that on men so what they're saying is it, you there's no guarantees that the kids ever going to be yours there's no guarantee and their tr and society has been doing this feminine primary society has been doing this for a very long time now because it knows that if a woman if if we're going to put women into the superior position if we're going to make it a matriarchy like you're saying if we're going to do that then it, we have to disenfranchise men of any claim over the reproductive process that's why i always say that like um, I say abortion is eugenics because it's women deciding 100% uncontested unilateral control over who gets born and who does not get born. And for them to more effectively 
do that, to have that control, we have to teach, they have to teach generation after generation of men that it doesn't matter if you're a father or not. It doesn't matter if you are the biological father, because that woman is going to be the one who decides who gets born and who doesn't get born. Wow. Well, Rolo, thank you very much for digging deep into the concept of the feminine primary social order. And I am convinced, I do believe, you know, we've been tricked into thinking that there's this patriarchy but really it's a matriarchy but it goes even deeper you know that's like that's social stuff it well, digs well, even deeper into the biology of things and that, when i talk when i talk about well, hold on, when i talk about blue the blue pill or unplugging I, I i look at that from the perspective of uh it being like behaviorism okay i think mm -hmm. that that boys are taught and raised and conditioned today as if they are defective girls that they right. need to become more feminine. They need to get in touch with their feminine side, right? How many times do you hear that? Um, that they need to be, uh, th that femininity, being female is correct and being male is incorrect. Right. And that you will see, that is the pretty much, if you distill the message of the feminine imperative down to it, that's what it is. But whenever, whenever I refer to the blue pill, I always say blue pill conditioning right. because men are boys are conditioned to become blue pill men today so that they're more serviceable so that they fit into that the the machinations of a female centric society and so when i come out here and i start talking i, I you know i'm unplugging guys or you know you're you're doing your work whatever that we become dangerous individuals because we're oh, making yeah. men aware of of the matrix we're making men aware of their conditioning so I, I wanted to put that out there because it's really, it's really about behavioral modification. It's about behavioral right. conditioning. And it happens from a very early age all the way up until you actually either unplug or you just live the rest of your life. And men don't realize that. They don't realize that every aspect of their upbringing and their, their conditioning to be who they are, who they think that they're or, they organically are, but we're actually a uh, an amalgam i guess of all the influences that have you know been you know, our, our parents our schools it's what i call the village right right our, it takes a village to raise a child right so it's like your your pop culture your music um your your parents your schools your religion all of that stuff influences that individual no 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 man is an island right i mean every every there's there's you know information is is developing and creating us as we as we go along we like to think that we have a lot of choice about things and we do have a lot of choices and i i still firmly believe in free will but i think that we are subject to the conditioning of our environments our cultures our religions our everything else and those institutions have become so thoroughly feminized that you can't avoid being blue pill conditioned and that's why i, I call it condition it's a very good distinction thank you yeah so I'd like to ask you about the natural female instinct of hypergamy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a new term for me this year, uh, introduced by you. What is, what is hypergamy? Okay. Uh, I get this question a lot. I, I practically own this search term on Google right now. <laughs> um, I think that if there is one uh, topic that I have discussed uh, more than anything else is hypergamy. Hypergamy is really almost, I would say, deliberately misunderstood now because it's uncomfortable for, for women to accept. But I think it's, it's interesting to me that women will embrace hypergamy when it serves their interest and they will sweep it under the carpet or, excuse me, de-emphasize it when it doesn't serve their purpose. Mm -hmm. So what hypergamy is this is, in a nutshell, it is women's female, or it's female sexual strategy. Women are looking for the bigger and better deal. They're looking for, when it, when it comes to sexual strategies between the sexes, men's imperative is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. That's just how we're built, right? We produce millions of sperm and every ejaculation we can potentially impregnate a million chicks. I mean, if we had a million girls, we could impregnate a million girls every time we get off, okay? That is reflected in our sexual strategy. So men tend to be what are called uh, our selected, which means that they spread the seed. That's what we're, you know, sow our wild oats, right? We, we, have, uh, we have social and like philosophical ideas about it because that is, our, that is our biological, our mechanical makeup. Well, women's mechanical makeup is about, well, it's about hypergamy, but it's about quality. It's about finding the guy who is the best, um, 
the best breeding stock, but also the best um, provider or the best, uh, the best long-term security, the best parental investment guy. So when women are looking for in a man is they're looking for something, they, they're looking for arousal and attraction. And what that is, is, and this is euphemistically, we call this alpha fucks and beta fucks or alpha seed and beta need. Okay. Um, what that boils down to is there are reproductive benefits in a man and then there are survival benefits in the man. So the reproductive benefits are he's got to be hot. He's got to, he has to look like the sexy fireman. He has to have a six pack abs. He's got to have the V taper. He has to look good. He has to be physically arousing. He has to say the right things. He has to be um, a good, uh, it looks like a good time to have sex. Good, he looks like a good sex time with this guy, right? I mean, it, it's, it's pretty obvious. Like, there's a reason why um, the hot fireman calendars sell and the dad bod calendars stay on the shelves. Okay, because women are aroused to physical act, you know, to to physical cues. Because this is this is part of women's evolved natures to see that and to see that as a, a see a man as a a good a good or a bad reproductive. Uh, prospect for them. So there's that side. That's the reproductive side. Then there is the um, the survival side, or the provisioning side, or the long-term security side, or the parental investment side. And this is the beta bucks or the beta provisioning side of women's hypergamy. So they're trying to balance these things out. So the beta side is what is the guy uh, comforting? Is do I have uh, familiarity with this guy? Um, is he a good provider? Is he is he loyal? Is he stable? Is he um, would he make a good father? Will he help me with these kids, or is he going to run off and be committed to his own sexual strategy, which is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality? Is he going to do that? Is he an alpha guy who's just going to have sex with me and leave, or is he the guy who's going to have sex with me and he's going to stay? Right. That's the guy that is the, the beta provider side. It's like cads versus dads. And what women are trying to do is they're trying to balance that. They're trying to find uh, the perfect balance of the guy who is the alpha, the alpha seed, and the beta need and put those two, two together in the same guy. Well, the problem with that is you could never find that idealized within the same guy. There's always a, like a guy who's predominantly alpha is most likely not going to want to settle down with you because he has opportunities. He can go and because he is, uh, you know, his sexual market value is, is high. He doesn't have to stick around with you. He can go on and he has other opportunities and he has, uh, has other prospects. So he's probably not the best bet. This is the, the stereotypical bad boy. Okay. The stereotypical, you know, rock band drummer, right? This is the guy that is, um, has opportunities, has other women on the side, has, you know, if, if, if you don't work out and if you don't put out as a woman, he has other, other girls that he can go off with. Well, then there's the guy who's the dutiful beta who is um, there to, to be the shoulder to cry on. Um, we, we sometimes we call these guys beta orbiters. They're the guys that kind of stick around and wait for her to, to sort of come around. And what happens is women's sexual market value is perishable. Men are always interested in fertility and sexual access. You know, is she, is she hot and is she available? Those are really the, the two things that, that men's sexual strategy looks for in a woman. So when men are asked, um, and there's this great book called Dataclism, when men are asked what is the ages at which women are the most attractive to them, those men will say, and it doesn't matter what age the man is, it, the, the guy can be 18 or he can be 80 years old. They mm -hmm. all say between the ages of 22 and 24 years old. That is, and it is, it is across the board, that's what, that's what guys prefer. Whereas for, men, for women, it's always five to seven years older than they are. So if a woman is 25, she's looking for a guy who's like maybe 31 somewhere somewhere in those within that that range so five to seven years older than she is because hypergamy does not seek its own level it's always looking for the bigger and better deal if a woman is like let's just i'm just going to put this into like nuts and bolts terms here if a woman is like say uh, her sexual market value let's just peg her at a seven she's always looking for the eight the nine or the ten if she's with a guy who is at her, her same sexual market value she is with him insofar as she can find or she's able to attract a guy who is above that level. And so what happens is in, in a society, in our feminine, we were talking about a feminine primary society, women have done everything that they can 
legally, religiously, uh, you know, politically, whatever they can to ensure that the security needs of hypergamy are met. So that's why we see, we see when we look at like say abortion, we were just talking about that. When you look at um, feminism, when you look at uh, no fault divorce, when you look at child support laws, when you look at all of the things that the social institutions that benefit women, all of those center on providing her with security in her sexual strategy. So what happens is women can make their own damn money, right? Women don't need no man, men are superfluous. They don't need that half of hypergamy anymore. They don't need the beta bucks anymore. They don't need that provisioning anymore. They still need the resources from that guy and there's ways to extract those resources through divorce or through maybe it's, uh, maybe it's uh, special dispensations in society and, and you know, people say, well, they're welfare queens. That's, that, that's not it. It's a whole series of institutions that, but what do they do? They provide for that secure, the, the security needs of hypergamy. So what is left? What is left is the alpha seed side. And so that's why you see women today focusing entire, that's why Tinder is so hot right now, because women can just mm -hmm. simply, can simply flip, you know, swipe left or swipe right. And it's all, I mean, it is social Darwinism at its best. So when women say, well, you know, we're looking for a nice guy who's funny and, and sweet and is good, you know, all these things that would make a guy attractive. They're looking for a guy that is arousing is what they're doing. And, and if you don't believe me, just go look at any woman on Bumble or on Tinder right now, because those apps are, are design, scientifically designed to appeal to women's hypergamous nature. So when I talk about hypergamy, I think you need to get, we need to get a couple things clear here first, because there's a lot of misconceptions about hypergamy. Um, the, the number one misconception is this, is that it should only, like hypergamy should only be defined as the anthropological definition, which means women have a tendency to marry up socioeconomically. That's part of hypergamy for sure, because they're always looking for the bigger and better deal. They always want to, and I mean, why wouldn't they, right? I mean, that's just, that's mm -hmm. just survival. You want, you want, you're not, you're not looking for a, a worse situation to live in. You're looking for a better situation to live in. And that's just, that's just makes, that's just mm -hmm. common sense right there. Um, but that's what, the sociological anthropological definition of hypergamy is and that's when when guys like me or the guys in the manosphere have taken hypergamy and we've broadened the definition of it to mean uh, to include women's sexual strategy and the the alpha seed and the beta need side of things and so um, we've broadened that definition and I'm glad to see like guys like uh, Jordan Peterson finally embracing the idea that hypergamy is a whole lot more than just what the basic uh, definition of it is but people want to throw it away they want to just say well hypergamy is not that important because it's just anthropological definition no it's a way way more than that um, the other thing that I see guys doing is they think that hypergamy is a straight jacket they think that if they get into a relationship with a woman then that woman is always going to be looking for the bigger and better deal she's always going to be if she finds a guy that will that that is better than you then she's going to cheat with him and move in with him and they think that that's the that's that's why I mean by the straight jacket that that's it's always going to be that way and there's no getting around it so why bother at all right that's the that's the MGTOW um, uh, the MGTOW definition or the MGTOW misconception I think is that if you get even if you got into a relationship with a woman it wouldn't matter because she's always looking for somebody who's better than you are well there's a lot of variables that go into that because just because a woman might be attracted or might be aroused by a man who isn't you doesn't mean she has the capacity to attract that guy it doesn't remember and then there's a lot of other um there's a lot of other personal buffers and checks and balances that go into buffering hypergamy when we when we bring up a boy and we understand the sexual natures of the boy we we or the male sexuality we know that male sexuality is always on women's sexuality is cyclic it's cyclic through their menstrual cycle for men it is always on and so as a result, over the years, human cultures have seen this and they say, we need to find some way to control this. We can't just have guys walking around with hard-ons all the time and, and killing each other for, access, or for sexual access for women. So we have to find things like, of course, like chivalry or, or honor and those things to, to keep that masculine, uh, the intense masculinity under control in some way. And mm -hmm. of course, sexuality is a part of that. So we teach our boys, you know what, keep your dick in your pants you know, you know, don't get, don't have sex until you're married. Those, those kinds of cultural, um, 
uh, you know, traditions or mores or whatever you want to call them to control that, that, that boys who will become a man's sexual nature. We don't do that with women now because mm. we're finally at a point in history. This is, and, and people don't really, I, I don't think people really get the seriousness of yeah. this. Once the sexual revolution happened, and once mm -hmm. we gave women unilateral control of the reproductive process with hormonal birth control, with uh, abortion rights, with uh, no-fault divorce, with the Duluth model of feminism, with all of that stuff, we have afforded women um, a freedom in their sexuality that they have never had before in human history. So we have un when, I, when I say this, I say we've unfettered hypergamy. And what we're seeing is women are taking that and they're running with that because they believe they're entitled to do that. They believe that, well, we've lived as slaves for, us for, for so long and now we're finally free of being, we're strong, independent women. Well, what does that independent part mean? That independent part means I'm independent of a man. I don't need you anymore. I don't need right. you for my support. I don't need you for my survival. Well, again, 43% of kids are born out of wedlock. I don't need no man because I can have all the benefits of that beta provider guy without having to marry you or without having, to, without having anything. So what am I going to focus on? Well, it's going to be the alpha fuck side of the, of the whole equation. So what, what happens is we've unfettered women's sexual strategy while we're still restraining, almost maximally restraining men's sexuality. Mm -hmm. And we don't dare tell women we, you, need to get your, you need to get your hypergamy under control. We don't dare say that because then we sound like misogynists and then we sound right. like repression or we sound like old school religious people, right? But that's the thing is we don't have a, a long tradition of buffering women's hypergamy in the way that we do now. We used to. Prior to the sexual revolution, we had religion to do that. We had social, social uh, institutions that would do that. Um, I'll just give you a quick example is my, uh, my mother-in-law once told me that like for a woman to have a child out of wedlock or to, to be like, say a teen mother or something like that. If the woman had that child who got pregnant and she wasn't married, they would take that woman and they would put her away because it was a social stigma for that woman to have gotten pregnant and it brings shame on the family. Right. It would bring shame, or if it were, might be a religious thing, right? Oh, well, she had premarital sex, and here she is. She's got a, ba she's got a love child, right? right? And you take that child and put it away and maybe put it up for adoption because there was that stigma that came along with being a single, unwed mother. And, you know, there wasn't the kind of programs that we have right now. But now, flash forward to 2019, after this, you know, here we are almost 60 years after the sexual revolution, you are encouraged to be a single mother. Freeze your eggs. Here's the sperm bank. Go ahead and voluntarily become a single mother. 43% are single mothers, right? Well, the reason is, the reason for that is because we've removed all those stigmas. We've removed all the checks and balances away from hypergamy. And we said, women, police yourselves. It's on you now. You know what you, you, you know the worst of your own nature. So we're going to, we're, as men, we're going to trade sexual access because you're now on the pill and we don't have right. to worry about you getting pregnant anymore. We're going to trade sexual access for granting you 100% uh, autonomy when it comes to the reproductive process. We're going to grant you autonomy and a control or a, we're, we're just going to presume that women are okay with that and they'll police the worst of their natures when it comes to hypergamy. Well, they're not doing that, obviously. <laughs> no. Um, but we don't realize that and the genie's out of the bottle now and we can't go and say, you know what, women, you guys need to check yourselves before you wreck yourselves. And I think it's going to take, it's going to take several generations for women to realize, you know what, we need to be in control. We need to find some way to buffer our hypergamous natures uh, because we're controlling men. We're controlling men's sexual natures and we've, and rightly so we've done that for, for since we were, you know, in hunter gatherer tribes. Okay. But, now we, ha and we used to have control over women when it came to their reproductive process. And it used to be that men were, were played a role in, uh, in hypergamy. We had a, 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 a place in saying, okay, these children will be born and these children will not be born. Or uh, uh, the, uh, this woman will be married or this woman will not be married. Now we've just We've just given up. We've just said, hey, you know what? When you have 100% control over this, you know best anyways. We're just these idiot men. We're just Homer Simpson. We're ridiculous in our masculinity because we've been taught that 
for the last 50 some odd years that we're just that that men are superfluous men don't know what they're doing and women have some sort of innate magical ability to solve men's problems just because they have a vagina so I think that when it comes to hypergamy the most important thing to understand is that it is women's sexual strategy um, and it goes from the micro to the macro and for the micro is is that um, women are seeking the best of two two natures in men they're looking for the alpha fucks and the beta bucks but then you can extrapolate that into that woman's personal sexual strategy then into a social strategy and then hypergamy then gets rolled into a political strategy which is when you see you know you see uh donald trump go head to head with with hillary clinton and it's a it's not a battle between two personalities it's a battle between him and her mm -hmm. and what is if if women have power what do women do with power when you give like we were just looking at the um like pat and i were looking at the the women who are the freshman class of uh the con of the congress right now um these are the women who are at the state of the union address and they're all wearing white and they would mm -hmm. get up and cheer for anything that was pro-female and they would sit there like this for anything else you know anything that he was saying because they 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 want to present this idea that we're under some sort of like uh you know, oppressive tyranny. Right. Guy. Um, but they only, they only cheer or they only support anything that, that promotes feminism, that promotes female empowerment, that promotes anything that has, that's why we'll never vote for a woman. Uh, and sorry, ladies, but I will never vote for a woman because when women get power, what they do is they use it to solve their hypergamous equation. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, I want to thank you also for a, a pretty amazing working model for dealing with this understanding. Uh, and, and you go over it in great detail. Pr pretty much the entire book, uh, Preventative Medicine, mm -hmm. is about this schedule of mating, which I thought, you know, after reading your first book and, and, and you know, the, the pain that's associated with being red pill aware, mm -hmm. the, pre the preventative medicine aspect and the schedule of mating was so empowering, knowing that you can kind of predict a woman's behavior on the micro through menstruation and then on the macro <laughs> through uh, the schedule of mating. Could you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how we can sure. navigate it? Um, in the second book, and I'm glad you brought that up because I really like the second book. I think it's, mm -hmm. it took a little while to mature and people, for people to really appreciate. It wasn't as long as my other books, but... Um, the reason that I wrote the, um, the second one was I had so many guys coming up to me and they were, cause they really loved the first book. And they said, I wish I would have had this information before I got married or before I had kids or man, where were you when I was 18? I wish I would have known all this stuff when I was 18. Um, and so I, I, I took that and I go, you know what? It would be, I owe it to these guys at least to write another book and, and, sort of give them an idea or give them a roadmap of what they can expect from women at different phases of women's maturity. So like I was, I, cause at the time I was still on the so swap boards. And so I was interacting with guys who were as young as 15 years old and guys who are 70 years old. And you know, the, the, it's funny cause the, the, the it seems so quaint when like a 15 year old says, how do I get a girlfriend? You know, and they're, they're, they, they don't know, you know, what to expect because everything's brand new to them. They've only been on the planet for 15 years. Right. Um, and they don't understand why, like they'll, they'll read my book or they'll read like something in the manosphere and these guys are young. Right. And they, they, they see like when I say, Oh, you gotta be dominant. You gotta do this. You gotta be funny. You gotta be, they have all these pickup artist techniques, all this other stuff that goes along with that. Um, but they, they can't apply that to the girls that they're attracted to because those girls haven't matured enough to, be, to appreciate uh, some of the seduction techniques or some of the more advanced things that would, would probably be very applicable to an adult woman, to a woman who's 25, 26 years old, but to another girl who's like 16, 17 years old, she's not interested in that. She's interested in how hot the guy is. She's interested in the physical at that point. And so I looked at that and then I looked at the progression of how guys, uh, you know, at different ages appeal to, to women. And it kind of struck me that there are different phases of maturity for women. And as women's 
as women grow and they become they become from girls and they go into like young women and they become you know older women that their priorities shift like the the priorities of hypergamy shift so when a girl is 16 17 18 years old she's looking for how hot that guy is she's looking for the alpha seed side she wants a guy who she wants the quarterback of the football team right she wants the guy who is hot H A W T hot. That's what, that's what he has to be. And he's got to have abs and he's got to be, have a cute face and he's got to look like, you know, the, the guy she sees uh, like Justin Bieber. She got to look like the, you know, that kind of celebrity look to the guy. And he still has to be, um, you know, still has to be sweet enough to, to be attractive, but she's primarily focused on the physical. And that sort of continues on through a woman's uh, what I call her peak sexual market value years, which is, like we were discussing before, women between the ages of 22 and 24 are the are at their peak when it comes to male arousal or male tra- attractiveness across the board. So I peg um, women's sexual market value uh, at their their peak sexual market value is about 23 years old. So it's in, in between those two. Um, might become earlier, might become later. And of course, if a woman gets fat, if there's other things that she does that lowers her sexual market value, that might change. But on average, right about there for our generation today, that's about where I would peg the sexual market value peak for women. And at that peak, her priorities for what, for what her intimacy is worth, meaning like what, what's the kind of guy that she wants to have sex with? What's the kind of guy that she wants to have a relationship with? Women are primarily interested in guys who, in, in the, phys, the physical side of things. They're, 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 you know, it's nice if the guy's rich, but he's gotta be hot. That's number one on the list. Um, it's it's nice if the guy has social social proof if he's pre-selected by other girls, um, but he's got to be hot. Yeah, it's just nice. really quickly. This is during uh, the twenty the, the peak market value yeah, formative. You call these the formative years. Yeah, these are the. So this, this is what I call the, party years, actually. <laughs> This okay, when, good. Yeah, this is when women, because this is, and this is also follows what I call the Sandbergian plan for hypergamy. Now, the reason I call it the Sandberg plan is because um, Sheryl Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, who has a book called Lean In, in that book, she states, um, when, it comes to, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to marriage and all that, have fun in your early days, pretty much. Like, have fun or date all of the bad boys, date all of the commitment-phobic boys, date all of the, and of course, by date, she means have sex with, all of the guys that are um, bad for you, who are the, the basically the alphas. Right. And then when you, get, when you get later, when you get to be 29, 30, 31 years old, which is what I peg as the epiphany phase, right. um, then look for the guy who wants an equal partner and settle down. <laughs> He's like, trust me, those guys are there. And these are what I call the betas in waiting. And, yep. and she, literally, nice. she literally puts into print everything that I or the Manosphere or the Red Pill has ever said about hypergamy yep. right there, black and white, one of the most, you know, recognized, empowered females on planet Earth. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna have to, you know, come up with a list of women who are like the Fortune 500 women, she's gonna be at the top of the list. She is basically confirming hypergamy. It's what I call open hypergamy. They don't hide it anymore. They don't need to hide it anymore. Right. Hypergamy used to be something that we would keep secret from men because it wasn't in men's best interest to know the game. Now women don't care if they know the game. They don't right. care if they, those guys do because they have reached a point where they can, they're independent of men. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter whether or not men know or not. In fact, they, they, they use it as a, a, a badge of honor right now. It's like, it's a, it's a point of pride for them to say, yes, I'm hypergamous and that, you know, I don't care what. So what I'm talking about is in those years, in that party years, it's what mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's Cheryl Sandberg was saying is that in, in those time, in that time between, let's just say 21 and 26 years old, Women are primarily interested in the physical. They're, fi- they're primarily looking for the hot guy, the good time. Um, the, you know, if the guy has, has other qualities, though, I'm not saying that those aren't, aren't important, but the number one priority is that guy is hot. Now, when, when this changes is when a woman's sexual market value decays. So if she's at her peak in 23, she's on her downswing when she gets to be about 25, 26, 27 years old, unless she has done a lot of things to keep that, to keep herself in, in better shape. But even if she hasn't, there's another generation or another crop of girls who are 22, 23 years old that are out competing them in the sexual marketplace. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, women, be, at some point, women begin to understand that they can no longer compete at the 
same level that they used to. That's what we call it, the wall. So when women hit the wall, they realize it's like it's a sports reference, really. You know, once you hit the wall, you've hit your peak uh, performance uh, capacity, and you can no longer compete at that same level anymore. You can still compete, but you're not as good as you were when you were 21, 22, 23 years old. Uh, so what, what happens then is when women get into what I call the epiphany phase, and the epiphany phase is generally around 29 to 31 years old, and that's when women acknowledge that their sexual market value has decayed to the point that they're no longer as competitive as their sisters are who are 22, 23 years old, right. and that they need, to, they need to cash out of the party years before <laughs> the party is over. Right. And so and a, lot, a lot of guys call this the cock carousel. I, I'm not as mean. I just say it's like the party's over and you need to <laughs> check out. Okay. The cock um, carousel. I love it. Yeah. Um, and so these, so what they do is they start looking for guys who are better providers. They start looking mm -hmm. for that half of the, uh, the hypergamous equation. Now, of course, yeah. people are saying, well, I thought, Roland, you just said that they, they don't need that. They're independent of that. Well, Yes, they're independent of that, but remember, women evolved to seek competency in men. They evolved to look for a guy who is dominant, and there's a lot more to security than just finances. Mm -hmm. So just because a woman makes her own damn money and can put, a, you know, put her own rock on her own damn finger, that kind of stuff, doesn't mean she doesn't want a man. And what mm -hmm. does she still want in that guy? Well, there's, there's, there's emotional security that goes along with that too. There's, mm -hmm. there's that. There's a need for that man in her life because men and women evolve to be complements to one another. And women are looking for that, but they don't realize that they are because they've been, their heads have been filled with this entitlement of, uh, you know, the hot guys that they've had fun with. Well, now they're supposed to be a, a nice, dutiful beta that's supposed to be waiting for me at the end of the uh, mm -hmm at the end of the road here and, and mm -hmm. uh, I better do this before I hit 31 or 33 because the odds of a woman settling down with a guy or the odds of a woman, um, you know, being married and starting a family decrease rapidly after 31 years old. So if a woman is 36 years old and she gets married, she is one of the lucky few that actually can consolidate on, you know, having her cake and eating it too, which is really mm -hmm. what, it, what it amounts to. So in that book, I, I schedule out all of the things that women tend to look for at different phases of their maturity. So when a woman gets to the epiphany phase, 29 to 31, she's you know, still looking for a hot guy, but that priority has shifted. And so now she needs a guy who's stable and a guy who ha would be a good father kind of mm -hmm. thing. That guy, that guy is a, if, if he's got those qualities, she's willing to accept uh, a, lower, uh, a lower quality guy when it comes to arousal. Um, if the guy is not as dominant, well, but he's got a lot of money, he's got a nice family, he'd be really good with kids. Those priorities for her intimacy shift at different parts of her life. And so now the girl who was 17, who was only focused on the physical, now that girl's 29 years old and she still likes to, a hot guy, don't get me wrong, but she's, her, her attraction and her, her arousal priorities have shifted because of where she is in life and what she needs. When women are between the ages of 29 and 31 years old, they are at their most necessitous from men. They will they'll never admit to this because they think that, well, I'm, I'm independent of men, but mm -hmm. they're at their most necessitous for men. And that's why I, I, I peg men's sexual market value peak at about mid 30s like 35 36 37 years old because it takes longer for a man to mature and it takes longer for a man to establish himself as a man to attain the things that make him maximally attractive and maximally arousing to a woman takes a lot of time way more than what what women are used to we are, we have the saying in the manosphere is women are and men must become and when men become they have to, it takes time to do that. It takes effort to do that. Right. And that's why when we see guys who are like 28, 29, 30 years old, and they have done nothing to really kind of prepare themselves for the future, to prepare themselves to be, you know, this, the woman's mate, like they've been sold this idea that these guys are going to be there already and waiting for them when they get to be 30. We call those guys uh, kid -olds. We call those guys prolonging their adolescence and we come down pretty right. hard on them. Whereas if a woman does that, we go, oh, she's just focusing on her career. We don't give them the same kind of grief that we give a man because men have a burden of performance. We, it, if there's one thing that's very important in a man's life, it is living up to the potential that that guy has. So if you've got talent, if you've got skills, if you've got drive, if you've got ambition, by the time you get to be about 35, 36, you're just starting to hit your stride. And that's why I, I peg that as the uh, peak 
uh, attraction phase for for women or for men, because women at their most necessitous find those guys the most attractive, and that's as attractive as you're going to be because it takes longer to do so. Now, is that is that always a hard and fast rule? No, but that is when most guys do their most significant work is in their late 20s to early 30s or mid 30s right around there and right then is when men start to hit their peak and that's when women go damn i wish i could get with that guy a lot of guy a lot of people misconstrue this they think that if i say that a woman's sexual market value peak is at 23 then they must necessarily all be getting with a guy who's 36 no because men and women are different. We have different, we have different things that we're attracted to. We have different things that we're aroused by. We have different things that we have different sexual strategies. And so what makes a woman at her sexual market value peak at 23 is not the same things that make a man at his sexual market value peak at 35, 36, somewhere around there. So it's important to make those distinctions. So I'm not saying that 23 year old girls are just like beating down the doors to get with 36 year old guys. They're not, but women tend to look for men who are between five to seven years older than them mm -hmm. because hypergamy can't wait. It can't wait for a good deal. They can't bet it's a, hypergamy can't bet a woman's eggs because eggs are a finite resource for women. It can't bet those eggs on an untested commodity. So you will you'll very, very rarely see a woman who is older than a man who has uh, who, who wants to go with younger guys, who wants to get with younger guys unless she's a cougar and she's going backwards from where she was. She was maybe mm -hmm. 40 years old and she's interested in college age guys. And even then, that's only for, for a, a very brief period of time. Yeah. If you have a woman who's, say, 30 years old, she's looking for a guy who's anywhere between 35 and 37 years old, somewhere in there. Um, because, because hypergamy is it's pragmatic. It understands that an older guy has probably established himself, has taken the time to build himself, has taken the, has, if, if, he's, if he's a man worth her, her while, he has established himself in society, he's established himself in his job, he's, he's still good looking, he still gets to the gym, he still is, is hot, he still has, he has, he's the complete package. Mm -hmm. And it takes longer for a man to be, to be that complete package than it does for a woman, because women are, men must become. And what happens then is women will see that and they'll see they'll, they'll want that, but they, you know, nature kind of plays a, a dirty trick on them in that they are on their declination of their sexual market value while he's on his inclination. Mm -hmm. and it's at that point, it's at that point of, of, uh, of, of mixture right there, I guess, at the, the point of contention, which is right about 30 years old for both of them, because a woman is, is on her steady decline once she hits 30. The man is on his ascension at that point, and she's hoping that that guy is still stupid enough to believe in all the blue pill lies, to still believe in all the idealisms and all the things right. that Disney and all of his feminine primary upbringing has taught him that he still doesn't, he still doesn't know that how the game is played. He hasn't met Rolo Tomasi and read the rational mail to, <laughs> to understand right. that that's the game that he's playing. That's why women hate that because I'm educating men about the game that women are playing and out what their role is in it. And most men see it as, you know, naturally as the, uh, the raw deal that it is. And so they say, I don't want to play that. I'm, you know, when, when, when I tell men don't, become monogamous until you're 30 years old. That's why I mean, because it takes time for you to be a good judge of character. It takes time for you to understand the nature of women, because when you get to be 30, 35, 36, somewhere around there, um, you are in the, 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 the script flips. So when a woman is 23 years old, she has the prime sexual selection of any human being on planet earth okay she can decide who she's going to have sex with and who she's not going to have sex with and she has a control over that like no man will ever ever know but that's when she has primary or peak sexual selection selectivity when men have that they have that right when they're about 33 35 somewhere in there and they don't realize that until they're there Yep. So, you know, if you once you get to be about thirty-five, you don't realize that women are like I have these guys that I counsel who will tell me that suddenly at thirty, thirty-one years old, all the women that didn't want to give them the time of day when they were in high school or they were in, uh, thank you Facebook, they still know who they were with in high school. Right. Um, but like all the women who are in their twenties and in their peak fertility window years or party years who would never have anything to do with them suddenly they find him irresistible 
Mm -hmm. At 31, 30, you know, 31 years old, suddenly he's irresistible. And he's still the same old guy. It's just that maybe he's made partner in his, his attorney, or maybe he's a doctor now, or maybe he's made the most of his potential. And he's, he's still stupid. He still doesn't understand the, the, the game that's being played with him. He, he, the guys will come up to me and they'll say, how come all these women are suddenly attracted to me now? And I, I have to explain it to them that you are now in your peak years of sexual selectivity. The, the shoe is on the other foot. The girls that was 23 who could select, she was, she's now necessitous and you are on your ascension right now and you can decide whether or not you want to reward her for all that stuff that she did in her party years by marrying her and saying, that's okay, I'm absolving you of all your sins, all of your past indiscretions are cool, I'm just going to, I'm going to marry you, I'm going to wife you up and we're going to live happily ever after. Or you can say, no, I don't want to sign on with that and I want to go find a chick who's 24 years old because now you have the primary sexual selectivity. Women hate that. They absolutely yeah. hate the idea that men would ever be able to have any kind of sexual selectivity because they understand that women's primary agency in this life is their sexuality. Their primary agency over men, their primary power over men is always going to be their sexuality. When you remove that, when, when women see that, remember women see that at their, at their peak at about 23, but when they get to be 29, 30, 31 years old, they something in their brain acknowledges that they no longer have that same control that they used to and they don't know how to deal with it and because we don't teach them we don't teach them hey you know we don't say hey you know there's going to be consequences for your actions right be, and and this is where we get get into the 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 social buffers and stuff like that. No one teaches women to control their sexual natures. No one teaches women, hey, this is hypergamy and you need to have control over this because men have sort of abdicated everything and you don't want men to step in and just, and, and take, you know, like uh, repressive, tyrannical control over you. You need to find some way to, to put yourself in check. But women won't do that because we empower them and make them believe that, that you know, they have superpowers. But, um, you know, and especially in an age where we inflate women's egos with social media so overly that that they will never get that. So getting through to them is really tough. That's one of the reasons why I think uh, um, Anthony wants to do this 22 convention is to sort of reach the earlier generations, kind of like what I did with preventive medicine, but reach the earlier generations of women and say, look, there are going to be consequences for your actions if mm -hmm. you follow this hypergamous plan um, and you you don't think about things in the future you don't think about what you're going to like i tell my my daughter just turned 21 and i tell her all the time i say you are entering into your peak sexual market values i'm 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 ruthlessly truthful with her i say you know what yeah every year after your 23rd year you're going to be looking back on 23 going damn i wish i could get back to that so plan for that understand you know hey you know what? maximize it make the most of it that you can but understand that there are going to be consequences for your actions, for the, the choices that you make now are going to affect you for the rest of your life. We don't tell our daughters this anymore. We don't say hypergamy is a thing and you need to be in control of it because if you're not, you're going to, you, either you are going to be paying that price or the guy that you end up marrying is going to have to, to, to you know, buy off your debt. It's going to have to buy off the stuff, they, all the debt that you incur, whether that's credit right. or not. All, you know, when you make choices, you, you borrow from your future to pay for your present. Well, don't expect that man to pay for, or to pay for your past right. the that you made in your past. And so this, these are things that I, I lay out there. So I've got a question about mm -hmm. that, you know, because when... Um, the, you know, she reaches that age where she wants to get married, you know, 30, mm -hmm. she wants to settle down and she's been around the block, you know, some maybe been with 25, 50, a hundred different men. Uh, I think that's a raw deal. I think that's a raw deal for, for mm -hmm. men. I, I wouldn't be happy to marry a woman that I knew had slept with 50 plus, even 10 plus guys. It's just kind of remember that paternity thing. Me. But I think most guys would agree that like it'd be nicer to have a woman that's either a virgin or or just outside the window of virginity. Right. I think it's what a are your lot. thoughts are on promiscuity in both okay. men and women. All right. I, I think that it is sort of unrealistic and untenable to think that uh, women are going to women or men are going to remain virgins because mm -hmm. when those traditions were created when we had okay no premarital sex that was probably a time when women men and women were getting married in their teens right so 
when uh, human beings weren't living as long a lives. So we're saying, okay, no, no premarital sex. Um, and I will, and I've heard your, I've heard your, uh, your discourse on premarital sex with, with Anthony. And there's, there's parts of it I agree with. I, I put it this way. I understand why there's a necessity for that tradition. That was one of those buffers against hypergamy, but it was also a control on men's sexuality as well. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of an across the board rule that was supposed to be there. And I, I, I don't think like in 2019, we realize why those rules were important. So yeah. first off is you have to remember that back when, when the Bible was written or whatever holy book that you, you read was written and said no premarital sex, most people were getting married right around 16, 17, 18. Even in Shakespearean times, you know, Romeo and Juliet were 16 and 17 years old. So um, there was you know, there wasn't an expectation to wait as long as there is now. So is it realistic to ask a man to say, okay, you know, you're going to save yourself for marriage, but you're not going to be fully a step. You're not going to be in your sexual market peak via years until you're 36 years right. old. Right. It's untenable to ask a man to remain a virgin until he's 36 years old. It's untenable to ask a woman to remain a virgin until she's, you know, in this case, most the age of the average age of marriage right now is 27 or 28 years old. So let's just say that as a, a good round number, 27 years old it is untenable to ask a woman to remain a virgin until she is 27 years old these days, especially with, I mean, just from a physical standpoint, you know, you're like, God, you know, I've been living on this planet for almost 30 years now. When am I going to get laid? That kind of thing. I have guys, I talk to guys right now who are virgins at 32 on, you know, involuntary celibates I, you, they could get laid if they had a hundred bucks and they came to, to reno i could go get them laid but they don't do that because they they want genuine desire they want a woman to actually want them they want their first sexual experience not to be with a hooker who's faking it they want it from a woman who's actually into them and i get that i understand why that is but i also understand what the purpose of you know a, a rule against premarital sex is um because when a woman has, uh, and this is, this, there's scientific research about this, a woman who, women who have higher notch counts have more sexual partners in their lives tend to be unable to form uh, strong emotional attachments to men later on that they're married. So if a woman has something like seven to 10 prior sexual partners, she is at a much higher incidence of divorce later on than if she was, say, around like two or three. Um, what's, what's really weird about this is that when a woman gets to be like 14 or 15, when she gets into like the, you know, the, the 10, you know, 50, the teens or the twenties, um, it's, it tends to level off. But the, the reason I think for that is because when women have sex with, with men, um, because their, their hypergamy is such that they're looking for the bigger and better deal, they're always taking the guy who is the apex partner and using that guy as the benchmark. So I, women, Guys always say, well, it's a numbers game. I don't, want a, I don't want a girl that's had, you know, 12 or 15 or 20 guys. Well, the reason that you don't, you don't want that, first of all, is that the first one is this, is that she's not, a good, she's not a good prospect for ensuring your own paternity. We just talked about that, how men's innate existential fear is getting involved with a woman, committing and, and, and basically uh, compromising and abandoning his sexual strategy to complete hers, mm -hmm. but yet... He has no assurances that the kid is actually his, right. and that's that's the trade-off. That's the the resource trade-off. Um, so when you see a woman who has who's easy, who is with uh, that, that's why guys kind of have that revulsion. There's there's actually uh, an evolved revulsion uh, part of our human nature. Like if we oh, see yeah. a dead, if we see a dead animal, or if we smell feces, or we see something rotting, like we see death, we we get away from it. You know, we, yep. we're oh, bolted by it we, we we but that's that's an unconditioned response it's like you you it's just part of our nature well there's, there's also that part when it comes to seeing a woman who is loose yeah. and you're kind of like you're, you're, you're hesitant the <laughs> yeah. reason is is because because your hindbrain knows that she's not a good prospect for uh -huh. ensuring your own paternity so that's <laughs> one thing the other part is this is that um Women who have a lot of partners have more opportunity to have that alpha impact um, more, become more significant. So if a girl has one partner, 
and the guy and you have a, a girl who has one partner who that partner was the the ultimate apex alpha and you got another girl who's got 10 partners but, but all the guys she's ever had sex with have been like really kind of beta before she met you and now you're the alpha the girl with the one partner who had the really strong alpha impression is going to be a worse prospect than the girl who had 10 uh, beta guys and you're the best and you're the next alpha who makes the biggest impression on her so when guys tell me it's a numbers game i tell them no it's an alpha impression game wow. so but the thing is is the woman who had 10 partners had 10 opportunities to have one of those guys or maybe two of those guys create a a really alpha impression like he was the guy that she had hot sex with in the foam cannon party in spring break in cancun okay that is that's going to be the guy that she pines for this is what we call the alpha widow dynamic so mm -hmm. it's the guy that she was so wild with and and just gave herself so freely to when she was in her party years and she was in college and she had such a great time but he wouldn't commit he was the alpha bad boy who had other opportunities and had other options to go and and he didn't choose her to, to wife up. He went off with whoever else he went with because he's alpha. He has that opportunity. Um, that guy will be the one that got away. Um, Katy Perry has a song, The One That Got Away. It's a, it, it, you remember we were talking about how we use our red pill lens? Go listen to that. Go listen to it. You'll, you'll never listen to that in the same way anymore because what she's saying is she's, she's whining and crying and pining for the guy who was the hottest, funnest, uh, most awesome sexual experience she's had in her life. Yep. And now she's married to this guy who's a good provider, but he's never going to be, he's never going to measure up to that guy. She, her, her good provider husband is never going to have a side of her, the sexual nature of her, like that guy in her past did because he was just so fun. It was, it was the right guy at the right time in the spring break and blah, blah, blah. So if you've got a girl who's got 10 men in her, on her, on her belt, her notch count, of those 10, how many of those guys were the fun alpha guy that she's going to pine for? So she has more opportunity because the pool is bigger. The pool right. of, of men is, is potentially bigger. And that is why I believe that when, when we say no premarital sex, that's what we're talking about. So it, it seems to make more sense to me that when a, you have a, a virgin man and a virgin woman and they get together, the only experience in sex that they've ever had has been each other. And so she has, he knows that he's getting her sexual best or whatever, whatever she can, you know, give to him. And that he is having a sexual experience with her that he's never had, you know, he's never had. And so you have that bonding. There's a, there's a much deep, I think there's a much deeper bonding. There's a much, um, uh, it's a more deeper connection, I think, because there is only one man and one woman. Now, what people will say is, well, you know, you want to, you want to go out and sample the field. You want to go and make sure what you, what you like sexually and you need to go and, and find out, uh, you know, variety, right? Cause that's really, that's what men's, uh, sexual imperative is, is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. And if you don't believe me that that's the case, go look at any porn site right now and look at how many niches of porn there are on Pornhub or wherever. Mm -hmm. And why is it that, Online pornography is is streaming. It's high qual, high def, high quality, free and ubiquitous. I can I I got my phone right now. You want to go look at porn? We can go look at porn right now if you want to. Why is that? Because men's sexual nature is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. Most men cannot do that. They can never achieve. They can never like I have a, I have an notch count of forty. Okay, and I used to think that that was a lot until I met somebody like Christian McQueen or. Goldman or these other guys, you know, a lot of these pickup artists who are in like the triple digits. And suddenly I feel like, oh gosh, why, how are they going to take me seriously with only 40? Right. But then I see a guy who's only ever been with like one or two women and they look at me like I'm a man whore. You know? <laughs> and so when I, when I, I, I look at the, the, the need, like most guys can't, most men's sexual strategy is what's called uh, strategic pluralism theory. And what that is, is that if a man who is lower on the sexual market value, he has no other choice but to invest himself in one woman. He has to be monogamous. These are the guys who are like the serial monogamists. He, because he is not very high on the sexual market value scale, he has to find other ways to make up for those deficits. So he's got to, got to, or, you know, have a really good job. He's got to in some way become famous. He's got to in some way be more ambitious because he's got to make up for the deficit that he's not that attractive on the sexual market value scale. But 
included in that is this presumption that he's only ever going to be able to stick with one chick. He's only ever going to, I'm going to find one girl. I'm going to put all my eggs in one basket because I don't have the opportunity that a guy who is higher on sexual market value scale to go out and experience more women. That's why we separate alphas from betas. We see the guy who is beta tends to stick Put, like he gets what we call one-itis or he believes in a soulmate myth. He has to because that's part of his sexual strategy because there's nothing else for him except for that. Those are the guys who get addicted to porn because they're only with one woman and they see pornography and they go, wow, look at all of this. Look, well, look what she's doing to him right now. Holy crap. You know, I've never seen anything. My wife doesn't do that with me. I, honey, check, you know, check this out kind of thing. And so they, they, they realize what it is that they're missing out on because of pornography or because of our over, um, I don't, I think we are under sexualized, but I think we are over eroticized. Um, Good the, point. Wow. Um, the, our, our social order right now, and that's by design, I should say, mm -hmm. uh, we're under sexualized and over eroticized. So we want to keep men with a constant hard on, but we want to slap them away and, and me to them if they ever express themselves sexually. Good point. So, um, the, uh, this is, this is one of Royce's maxims, but the goal of feminism is the maximal, uh, unrestriction, unfettering of hypergamy, but the maximal restriction of men's sexual sexuality. So we need to keep men in a box, but we need women to be as free spirits as they possibly can because they've earned it for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, but why is that? So women have 100% uncontested unilateral control over the reproductive process. And men, you have no control whatsoever. If the woman gets pregnant and she wants to have the abortion, you have no say in that. Her body, her choice. She can do whatever she wants to. Um, so uh, that's the legal side. You want to talk about micro to macro when it comes to hypergamy, that's that. But, um, but anyway, I, I forgot. Where, where were we at now? <laughs> well, let me ask you, because this is all great information, but moving forward, uh, your, your, your last book, your third book is called Positive Masculinity. I'd love to explore what that means. And also, I love the fact that you're writing a book on red pill and religion. Mm -hmm. And I think these are two ideas that, uh, that shed light on, the, on what's possible for men. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to talk about that. You, even, okay. you know, in terms of being an alpha, can you become an alpha? As, as opposed to, you know, being beta I believe, conditioned? I believe, and, I, I believe most men are naturally alpha. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I agree. <laughs> I would say that, um, and that's that's actually kind of the good news. I think of the red pill, is I think that when you look at little boys and you look at how they're brought up, and one of the things I had to do when I was studying psychology is I had, and this I wish I would have specialized in this to uh, to a greater degree, but I had to take uh, classes on child psychology. And my daughter was actually my primary sort of guinea pig and, you know, it was my experimentation. So I learned a little bit more about how little girls interact socially than I did boys. But I knew, mm -hmm. I knew you know, it's not that I didn't have any experience with that, obviously. I have a brother. Um, and I think that what, what we do right now is we teach our boys as if they are defective girls. We teach them that it is to be more feminine is to be more correct. That if you would learn like what most, was it 78% of teachers right now are female from kindergarten through college, 78% in Western society anyways, 78% of the, the teachers you are going to have male or female as a male or female are going to be female teachers. And the female teachers teach from a female perspective. They teach, uh, yeah. and if, if, uh, I can show you example after example. After hell, I, I wrote most of the third book about that. Uh, one of the reasons I wrote the third book is because I had guys asking me, you know, I've got, I've got children, I've got my boys. When would be the best age to let them read the rational male? Like they're saying, like twelve years old or something. I'm like you're crazy. Um, but I understand the desire for that because the desire to teach the next generation is going to be a big deal. And, yep. you know, we're about, we're about to like this week, we're about to do the, the patriarchs edition of the, the 21 convention and you and I will both be at that. And I, one of the reasons I agreed to that was because uh, I think that we need to inform the next generation. I also agree to do the 22 convention, which is teaching women, you know, it's a, it's a convention by men for women to, to teach women, you know, red pill, uh, you know, understanding to give them the education that they never got to, right. to sort of, you know, become a, the buffer that doesn't exist anymore. At least that's the way I'm seeing it. But I think that it's very important to teach the next generation 
And little boys are naturally alphas. They're naturally uh, rambunctious. They're naturally, um, you know, full of themselves. They're, they are, one of the things that the, the feminine primary social order does is it teaches boys to make women and womankind their mental point of origin. And you and I have talked about this before. This is one of the primary tenets of, of my work is I stress mental point of origin for, for men just in pretty much everything I do. If, if there's one thing that you learn about uh, the red pill, uh, you don't take anything else away, understand that you need to become your own mental point of origin. Well, mm -hmm. we teach our boys to remove themselves as their mental point of origin and to place womankind on that pedestal. Right. I'm sure you, I'm sure you've heard this before how we say, you know, you need to not knock that woman off the pedestal. You need to put yourself on the pedestal. Well, what we do is we teach our little boys from the time that they're five years old, that womankind is on that pedestal and that right. you should be doing everything for affirmation from, from women. And usually that's a teacher. It might be a sister. It might be your mother. Usually it's your mother. And then it becomes the girlfriend and then it becomes, well, then it becomes the potential girlfriend. Like right. who, if I just had a girlfriend, this is how I would teach her, or I would, I would treat her. Right. If, uh, and then when you get the girlfriend, these guys sublimate everything about themselves and all the decisions they make in their life are about sustaining the relationship they have with the girlfriend. And then that right. becomes sustaining the relationship with the wife. And then they are trained to be betas. They are conditioned by the blue pill to be beta serviceable guys. So when they get to be 30 years old, they're what I call betas in waiting. They're the guys who have done everything by the book that they've been told by their female teachers all the way up until they're 30. So that when that woman finally has a use for them, that they're there waiting and are available and they're ready to play the game the way that they should have been taught by their female teachers when they were five years old or Disney or pop culture or whatever. Right. So I think it takes a village to crush the natural alpha out of boys. Yeah. And we do that very efficiently this day, in this day and age. And we're doing it early and earlier and earlier. I see mm -hmm. when, when people are trying to convince us that it is normal for a three-year-old child to have the capacity for abstract thought and have the capacity to understand his own sexual nature as to think that it is transsexual or trans, transgender that it was born the wrong gender, it, it, it's, it's madness to me, but I do understand yeah. the method to the madness. And the method is this, is that the village, the, the gynocracy, whatever you want to call it, has to get to our kids earlier and earlier. Right. And so if you can convince people that it is normal for a three or a four-year-old boy to have the, you know, the presence of mind to choose for itself that it wants to be a girl, for the rest of its life, and then to institute laws that say, oh, we're going to give you hormone blockers, or we're going to step in, and we're going to take control of the physical aspect of you. What I see that is, is that is, is like the, the feminine primary, the village, once again, exercising its control over our, over our men, over our boys right now, because yep. I think it sees it losing control over men. And so it has to get to them earlier and right. earlier. And that's why I wrote, the third book, uh, the, the, a full third of the third book um, is dedicated to the red pill parent. Mm -hmm. And that's raising both daughters and, and sons, of course. Um, and the things that a guy who is a red pill aware can instill in his children uh, at an early age and, and to make those guys aware of, of the, the matrix that their children are still part of. Just because you've been cut away and your eyes are open and it hurts doesn't mean your son and your daughter are. And they're right. getting bombarded with this every single day. You're yeah. one guy, but the village has pop culture, it has religion, it has the schools, it has every aspect of society. And what they're doing is pounding in that one message to, to them, which is it's bad to be a boy, it's good to be a girl. Right. And, and that's why when you see most transgender shifts are from a boy to a girl. Amazing. And I'm not saying there's not the other way around. There is, but the, primarily it is from boys to girls because mm -hmm. girl, or like, for instance, I'm probably sure you're, you're familiar with that. Uh, the, um, what is it? The, the, the drag queen kid, uh, Desmond, oh, yeah. Desmond, who's 11 years old, whose parents put him on, you know, put him on stage at a gay strip club to be a, uh, a drag queen at 11 years old. How's that and not child they, abuse? <laughs> well, and the kid goes on Good Morning America and, and everybody claps and applauds for him. This is all so this weird. Is so, so great. But, 
uh, and and in what world is that at, at, at all acceptable? If you were yeah. to rewind time back just 10 years, people would be appalled at that. But yeah. today we think that that's normal. And we think that it's, we, mm -hmm. we praise when a, the, the only time we praise masculinity in mainstream society is when a man acts like a woman. When, yeah. Like we were just looking at a, I was looking at this one video of this guy. I think he was in Holland or something like that, but he was prancing around in some like, uh, like kind of a seafoam blue tutu or some, you know, ballerina outfit. And he's dancing with his son because his son's really into frozen and they go and they, you know, lip sync the, the Elsa song to free, you know, let it go, let it go. That kind of stuff. So he's dancing around the, 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 the video went viral. It's yeah. been on like every damn new, it's been on good morning America and everything. And they praise that ridiculous, <laughs> that, that trans it's, it's, it's what's called, uh, Jack Donovan, you should, when you, when you are at the, the event, um, ask Jack Donovan about transvaluation because transvaluation is the switching or it's the normalizing of bad to good or good to bad. Right. Yep. And it's a really interesting concept. But so anyway, I wrote, um, I wrote that third book uh, about that. I also wrote it about the state of masculinity. I think that people wanted, didn't want me to name it positive masculinity because they thought that it, implied that there is such a thing as a negative uh, a negative masculinity or there's a toxic masculinity and i don't believe in toxic masculinity i think that is no, another means of control another social means of control to to disempower and to keep men uh to keep men stupid of course but to also uh get men to qualify their their expressions of masculinity as good or bad. I would, I would argue this is that there is no such thing as toxic masculinity, but there is only just masculinity. And there are aspects of masculinity that align and are cooperative with the female imperative. And there is the aspects that don't align with it, that contradict it, that directly conflict with it because it is, it is in men's interests and not in the feminine imperatives interests. And those are the aspects of masculinity that, are deemed toxic and right. we're, we're and that that was and toxic masculinity is passe now toxic masculinity is gone um as of like say a year or two ago and now you're seeing a push to make society believe that all masculinity is toxic it's no longer toxic masculinity it's masculinity is toxic right so anything that is masculine so what do we see we see these we see these uh programs at at various big universities that are uh re-education programs for masculine men so that they can be uh less toxically masculine or mm -hmm. there be masculinity studies uh and and those masculinity studies are really just you're a bad man and you need to you need to check yourself and be less you need to be more female you didn't get the proper training when you were five years old so now we need to re-educate you or you need to go back for a remedial class and getting in touch with your feminine side and understanding that you are living in a feminine primary social order and how dare you actually uh you know suggest that there's anything positive about masculinity so people when i was writing the third book people were worried that 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 was going to make that association but i think that masculinity can be very positive it always has been very positive mm -hmm. and you'll notice that i never use the term traditional masculinity I always use the term conventional masculinity because I think that there are aspects of masculinity that are unique to men, to the male of that particular species. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a human. It could be a dog, okay? There are, there are aspects of a male dog and that male dog's nature that a female dog does not have because it's not wired for those things. It did not evolve a mental firmware to have this, those same features and vice versa. But Today, we want to believe in the blank slate. We want to still grasp the idea that we're all born equal and that it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, you, it's just the plumbing. Everything else is just equal, which is absolute 100% pr provable horseshit is what it is. <laughs> and, and, I, and I keep trying to stress that because a lot of stuff that I see as criticism of the red pill and, and the manosphere, almost all of it always comes back to a firm belief in the blank slate, which is what I call e well, what I call equalism uh, or egalitarianism right. is this idea that men and women can only, are always here, right? We're all, we only, we never, no one is above, although when you do that, the woman is always above because a woman has sex as her agency and men are always going to be necessitous for sex. So the woman is always a little bit above, but we want to pretend 
that we have an equal relationship. We want to mm-hmm. pretend that, uh, I, I, you know, it's 50-50, I play even Steven with you. And women aren't looking for that. They're looking for direction. They're looking for masculine mm-hmm. dominance. They're looking for mm-hmm. competition. There are masculine, conventionally masculine characteristics in each man that women are looking for because they are attraction cues, they are arousal cues. Um, so when I talk about conventional masculinity, I'm distilling it down to the component parts of what it is masculine masculine because everybody has a different tradition like i i i don't know what your ethnic background is but i'm fairly sure that your traditions of masculinity are different from my traditions of masculinity or somebody who is in uh you know uh, dubai and somebody who's in canada and somebody who's in south africa you're all going to have different traditions but there are still conventional aspects of masculinity that make us all men and that's one of the things i think is a, the beauty of the 21 convention or the manosphere in general is that we can all come together as men and relate our experiences with one another so that we have a more complete understanding of intersexual dynamics, but also an, an understanding of conventional masculinity and what is what it's like, what, what is the experience like to be a man on planet Earth in 2019? And that, so that was one of the reasons, that was the other thing that I was writing about in, in that book, in the, the fourth book, I'm covering religion. And I think this is probably gonna be your hot topic because you and I are going to be doing a, a seminar, a, work, a workshop at this upcoming uh, 21 convention. And we're gonna be discussing issues of religion. And I'll just tell you what my, my point in doing the fourth book is, is I had, from the very beginning, I wanted to include issues of religion in my work. But I, I held off from that because I think that the red pill needs to be objective. It needs to be based on hardcore objectivism. It needs to be based on as much as we can make it objective. I understand we're human beings, so there's always going to be biases. There's always going to be our own influences in it. But I think that as a commitment, we need to be committed to making the red pill what, I call, what, what is known as a praxology, okay? It's the study of human behavior in that human behavior has a purpose. And what are the motivations? And what are, why, why do we do what we do kind of thing? It needs to be um, amoral, a-religious, a-political, a-racial, a-whatever. It needs to r- remain above all of that because as soon as you incorporate religion, as soon as you incorporate an ideology, as soon as you incorporate a political stripe or whatever, uh, then you're co-branding that, uh, that otherwise objective praxology with, with that ideology. And right. so I, I, I see that there's a really a big need for, um, for separating those two. And I like to think of, I mean, I, I name my blog and my books, excuse me, The Rational Male, because I have a commitment to being as rational as I possibly can. It's like, and, and sometimes that rationality steps on the toes of ideology and it's really tough. But I wanted to incorporate some religion into what I talk about. Like when I, one of my, my policies I've always had since, I, since day one, since I even started writing at SoSwap, was I would never talk about issues of race or religion or politics um, in and of themselves. If those <clears throat> topics crossed over into intersexual dynamics, then they're a free game. So <clears throat> like when I wrote about um, Hillary and Trump, I'm writing about that from uh, gender politics. I'm, I'm writing about that from what it, you know, female empowerment versus you know, male empowerment. Um, I have a really great post called um, uh, The First Female President, and I go into politics, but I go into it from an intersexual dynamics perspective. So it's not that I won't talk about those things. It's just that I only couch them in, uh, in the manosphere, in talking about men and women. So I wanted to do that, and I've got a really good friend named Dalrock. I don't know if you've ever checked out any of his, his work, but he's a, he's a Christian guy. Um, I, I'm presuming, I know he's Protestant. I'm pretty sure he's evangelical. Um, there's a lot of guys in what we call the Christo manosphere, uh, and these guys are, they, they understand and they accept a lot of what the red pill has to say. They want to, they want to, they, they make the same conclusions that you and I do, of course, is that, um, Religion used to be a buffer for uh, hypergamy. It used to be a buffer for for social, uh, you know, social things. Um, but they don't they they don't 
embrace like the pickup artist aspect of it, of course, but they understand the intersexual dynamics that we talk about. And I really wanted to add that in there, but then I started reading Dalrock's blog and he was doing it better than I could. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to leave that up to Dalrock. But for at least the last 10 or 12 years, I've realized that there, there's a definite need for a book or an, a better understanding of how the red pill, um, as an intersexual, as intersexual dynamics, how the red pill um, dovetails or incorporates into re mainstream religions, because I kept seeing story after story of how feminism and how, because we live in a feminine primary social order, how is that social order infiltrating and assimilating mainstream uh, religions? And so that's what I dedicated the book to at first, and I'm still going to do this. This is still part of the book, but I had guys who are Christian guys saying, I, I'm red pill and I understand and I see all this stuff, but um, but I don't believe in premarital sex. Can I still practice game? And the answer to that is, of course, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. you're, just, you're just handicapped in that you can't spin plates or you can't be as non-exclusive as somebody who wouldn't. Um, do the principles still apply? Yes, of course they do. Um, but I had so many guys hitting me up from the Christian sphere to ask me and to, to get advice for, you know, for how things are in their church. Like they would hit me up and they would say, you know, everything in my church has become, like I'm, I'm, I've got my red pill lens on and I'm seeing... Uh, things for the first time in the church and I'm seeing how corrupt our church has become and how, how corrupt our faith has become because we've allowed women into positions of authority within the church and they are using that authority to re reform and redesign that religion into something that is more acceptable to the feminine imperative. Right. So that was my starting point for the book. Uh, it goes into a lot more than just that, but it's been my experience. Um, one of the main themes of the book is how uh, the gynocracy, how the, the feminine primary social order has assimilated mainstream religion as part of its expansion and its power consolidation. So when I see like a Presbyterian minister who's female uh, saying that God isn't male or saying that uh, you don't have to be uh, you don't have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. And she still calls herself a Christian and basically denying articles of faith that you would, you would associate with that particular religion. And just because she's a woman, she gets to go and say, you know, uh, it, your faith is no longer valid. And this is what the new faith is going to be. Right. And I see that in, a, a, I don't want to just pick on Christianity because this is, I've, I've interviewed uh, Jews. I've interviewed Muslims. I've interviewed um, Christian guys. I've interviewed, uh, I'm actually starting to interview people who are familiar with uh, the Hare Krishna movement because Krishna is a really big deal now to Western women because it is very, I, I what if, for whatever reason, I think uh, the, the Krishna side of Hinduism has uh, embraced the feminine imperative and they're, they're using that as sort of a recruitment effort to get Western women into the Krishna movement, which is weird to me, but, um, but now I'm sort of like studying that. But in all of these religions, what I'm seeing is the, the females will come to a position of authority. They will, and, and usually this is through the church culture. And so they will get into the church culture and feminism will get into that church culture. And because women are the primary consumers in the United States, most churches, and I'm not just picking on Christianity, but most churches are businesses, they're franchises. And to stay solvent, to keep the lights on, to keep the tithe checks coming in, the message has to be catered to the prime demographic of that business, which is the women. You have to tell the women what they want to hear. And what they want to hear is female empowerment because that's all they've ever been brought up with from the time they were, you know, six years old. So what do pastors do is they incorporate that feminist part of church culture into the doctrine. And so the doctrine is now we're going to talk about, uh, how men and women ought to behave from a religious perspective. And, oh, uh, our doctrine is changing now. We're going to allow women to be teachers. We're going to put women into positions of authority. We're going to ordain them as ministers. We're going to ordain them as whatever church leader it is. And we're going to grant them the ability to come up here and teach the masses kind of thing, even though our holy books say that we should never do that. That they directly forbid that, but you know what? It, this is 2019, so we're going to uh, mm -hmm. we're going to make that change, and we feel pretty confident in that. And so, what you do is, when women get into that position, they've changed the doctrine, and then eventually, 
over the course of about a generation, they end up changing the faith. And I think right now we're seeing the mainstream faiths be restructured to be more feminine compliant or more right. compliant with the, the female imperative. And so you'll see, like, I, I, I've been following this one, uh, I, think she, I think she's Lutheran. That she's got tats and she looks like a lesbian and she's got, you know, she's got the short hair and she looks like a biker chick. And I can't remember her name off the top of my head right now, but she just went through just last, I think it was last year, she melted down a whole bunch of purity rings and had them reforged into a giant uh, effigy of a vagina. And she gave the, 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 the platinum vagina to Gloria Steinem. And this is all in a church, all under the auspices of, of it being part of Christianity. And this is the new Christianity. And this is where we're going with this now. And in every case, in every, every uh, female religious leader that I follow, that's the case. That's the story. It, does, it doesn't change. As the woman gets into a position of authority and then they, change, they reform the religion to fit feminism, but also to fit a Unitarian Universalist outlook so it's always about let's make the tent big it doesn't matter what you believe in uh god's not a man uh you don't have to believe in jesus to go to heaven just come on in here and everything every, you know we're all gonna it's the the church of oprah it's this multi <laughs> multi uh, uh interfaith church is what it ends up becoming so right. you have a church that might you know like catholicism might have been uh you know a, a church that's been around for th you know thousands of years now because a woman in 2019 says come on in here uh, things are different. Uh, you should look this up. I, I want you to look this up at some point. There's a, um, there's a church in San Francisco, and I can't remember the name of it. I think it used to be a Catholic church, but they have what's called the, uh, the Beyonce services or the Beyonce worship <laughs> services. And what it is, is it's exactly that. It's, female, it's a female church leadership that opened the doors and basically turned the church into a nightclub and it's a celebration of it's a celebration of uh, multiculturalism, and it doesn't matter what your faith is. Just come on in here, and everything mm -hmm. that was was hard and fast rules about that particular faith are just thrown mm -hmm. out the window. And it doesn't matter if it was if it was Lutheran or Presbyterian or Methodist or or uh, Church of Christ or whatever it is. And I see this even in really hardcore evangelicals now. You got someone like Beth Moore who is, is fundamentally changing that religion because she's been allowed to go from being a, a you know, women's ministry leader to being somebody who is running a church or who is in charge of, you know, the message of that church. And now you're going, I, I would not be surprised to, to hear that Beth Moore or somebody like her um, is considered, you know, heretical or is considered um, uh, more mainstream, more Unitarian. And by Unitarian, I mean, like, it doesn't matter what your faith is. You just get in the doors here because it's a business. Once again, it's like, we need more people right. in here. We need more tithe checks. We need people to support this. Uh, it's tax exempt. Why not? Let's get it. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you erase all of the things that were limitations to that? And, and be, well, of course, because it's faith, but we're, we've, so many people have lost faith right now that I think that, um, that they still want that unity. They still want that tribal affiliation. They still want to be able to gather together and be, you know, what is it? Um, spiritual, but not religious, you know? Right. <laughs> um, yeah. What a joke. And what I also find interesting also that in, in my studies for this one is that men have left the church in droves. Right. The, the church uh, demographics is, a, it, it's funny because it's like 80% women and 20% men. And the men that are there are towing the feminist line. They're the ones right. who, are, who are giving the the Mother's Day sermons that praise women and the Father's Day sermons that, that say, men, you need to measure up. You're not doing a good enough job. There's something wrong right. with you, you men, you men folk. Uh, you know, God is our, our father, but, um, you know, he's a perfect father, unlike you men. You know, the, those, those, those not so subtle um, messages that go along with that. Whenever, whenever I listen to pastors talking about um, issues of intersexual dynamics or like how men should marry women or how men should treat women or how women should, there's, it's always how men should treat women. It's never about how women should treat men. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as a response to that, men are saying there's nothing for me here anymore. And I, I believe that fervently right now is that men are 
leaving the church because there's nothing there for them. There's, no, there's nothing spiritual there for them. There's nothing faith there for them because their faith is being converted into, you know, whatever the feminine imperative wants it to be. And in fact, their old churches are actively hostile to the men that are in that church in that they are told that they need to man up and there's always this constant qualification. And oddly enough, that qualification coincides with how women qualify men for their hypergamous choices. And so it's like, you're not measuring up. You're not as good. You, you're not as good as you could be. Um, and if, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And they end up conflating the woman's will or the whatever they end up conflating the feminine imperative with the Holy Spirit. Right. So uh, mm -hmm. the, the women in the church end up becoming the intermediary between the man and God. <laughs> so, so if the woman is right. is upset with the man, if the woman is not putting out for the guy, if the guy is not doing what the woman wants to do, it means that God is displeased with the man via the woman going through right. the woman. Which is backwards. Which is backwards, yes, very very much so, because usually it's men need to be the spiritual heads heads of in, it's headship, right? Right. Uh, and but so we've reversed that, and we have uh, I've I have heard in in my research here I've heard you know, church leaders, guys from Focus on the Family say that women are closer to God than men are. And I think that that's a really dangerous, dangerous precedent to set in churches right now, because what that, what that means is, is that women dictate the word of God. Women will, will tell you what God means. And if you don't do what she says, and if you don't measure up to what the feminine imperative has taught her that men should measure up to, then God is displeased with you. And so now you add this element of metaphysics yep. to the whole thing. And it's existential I, I, now. Yeah. Everywhere. And I, I find that most guys who are in the church are there for two reasons. They were boys that were raised in that culture. They were raised in churches. Or else they are men who are married to women who go to church, who drag them into the church. Very, very few men, young men, uh, go to church on their own volition. They are either dragged there or they were born there. They, men, because they're not, fine. If, if a man has spiritual leanings, if a man has, and, and I'm not, a lot of people want to say, well, you're the rational male. What are you talking about religion for? Well, I think that there's a part of, of human nature, of, of particularly men's human nature, to question our existence, to right. have existential questions, and to have these. There's, I think that there is a part. There's, I would almost argue that there's a part of our brain that is open to the idea of metaphysics. That there's yes. something beyond this. There's something beyond the physical. There's something beyond just what my five senses can pick up. And that's one of the reasons why I, I have a belief in God is because I'm not so full of myself or full of my own, you know, I don't have the hubris to say that I got it all figured out right. because I can, I can say that, you know, I can only experience reality through the five senses that I have. That's not to say that there isn't something else that's going on around me or there's other forms of energy that I am just simply not able to pick up on or be sensitive to because I lack the organ to do that. So if I can, I can see with my eyes, I can hear with my ears, I can smell, I can taste, I can touch, all that good stuff, but there might be something else going on in this environment around me that, it, that I can't see, touch, taste, or whatever. I'm, I, it's invisible to all of my senses, but that doesn't mean that it's not there. It, and I, I use this as an example. It's like if you have, um, uh, like we didn't know what infrared uh, infrared was, you know, the infrared spectrum was until we figured it out on our own through mathematical means or whatever. And now we have infrared night vision goggles and stuff. Who knew that we could actually see in the dark, right? We were, we were blind in the dark before, but now we realize that mm -hmm. there's other spectrums of light that we couldn't see that we, you can't smell it. You can't taste it. You can't see it. can't anything, but it's there. And it is, you know, or like when, uh, when you have a dog whistle and you blow the whistle, right. the dog can hear it, but you can't hear that. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's just that you don't have the organs to be sensitive to that. So mm -hmm. I extrapolate that into a bigger sense that I, do, I might not have the organs to experience certain forms of energy or certain things that are going on around me that I don't know anything about. So that was what I'll go, I go into it in the book. I don't want to. That's very it. rational. But yeah, the, but yeah <laughs> exactly. That's very there's rational. A, there is a rational case to be made for God. And I don't, very cool. that, I don't think enough people do that. The other thing that gets me is like a lot of people want to say, well, if you include the word evolution in anything that you say, it turns the religious set off immediately. They, if, you, if you say evo psych, 
oh, those guys are just, that's just, uh, you know, poppycock. That's just, you know, that's a pseudoscience, right? Or evolutionary biology or evolutionists or e you don't even have to say evolution. You just put EVO in front of something and people yeah. are like, they, they get turned off to that. And I, yes, am, both ways. I am also a firm believer in evolution. And I don't necessarily think that there is a disconnect between, um, between the belief in God and evolution. I, I agree. That evolution is a thing. And I, I look at it this way. I think that evolution is, or Evolution is the how and God is the why. Very good. I like so, that. Yeah. Man, this has been amazing. I appreciate you, Rolo. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to expanding this conversation when we speak this weekend. Hey, you're there. You're breaking up a little bit. Yeah. But I wanted to thank yeah, you yeah, for I got your you. time here today, man. I want to thank you for your books. I want to thank you for your being here on this planet, dude. Sure. And uh, I had a great time. I'm looking forward to maybe. Yeah, I'm looking forward to. I, I think I think people are going to be in for a real treat when we do our workshop together. I I, I don't think anybody's going to expect this. So. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right, bro. Well, safe travels, and I'll see okay. you in a couple of days. All right, man. You too. Thank you. See ya.